are listening to Gorgas, you idiot. Diabetes does run in, in the family. Okay. And uh, so you got to be careful for yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess that doesn't really bother me. Though. Are you guys like, skinny though? Are they all skinny like you? Like, those guys are not that skinny. Okay. Yeah. I think I, I might have some diabetes in my family too, but they're all like, I'm like, does it, is it gonna get me if I'm not fucking chugging soda and eating McDonald's and shit, or do, or is it just is it the it's hereditary genes too, man? I don't Fuck know. Genes, well, I think dude. if it's like more prone to it, then be best not fuck right. with that extra shit. Yeah. You know, there's so much good food out there that's not that bad for you. Yeah. And for and and like as far as drinks go, like water, like cheers, dude. I, I mean, I yeah, I'll drink one of those every now and then if I don't have coffee around. Yeah, sometimes you have to. But all I drink is coffee and water, just straight and, coffee. and then straight whiskey. That's my alcohol. I had a boss that was like. He was like the big guy in the music industry in Portland, which is not saying much, but uh, big time, big time, dude. Top of the bottom, top of the bottom, dude. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and he would like, he everybody drank coffee in the office, and everyone drank it black. And I got it was like a little office building that had like four of us in there, six oh, of yeah. us in there. And I was like, oh, like you guys don't have cream and sugar. And he he gave me like the most g'd up thing. He he's like. Oh, I can run down to the store and get some for you. If you need, if you need, something, <laughs> if you need, if you need it sweet, right. milky, and yeah. creamy, and I, I was get just that like, for you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Queer, you know. <laughs> it's like, dude, god damn. Okay, fine. And ever since then, I got a taste for just straight coffee. Oh yeah, which is nice it's- because like. Coffee doesn't always have to be a fucking dessert, bro. No, I have, it shouldn't be. I have friends though. You'll go out to breakfast with them and shit, and they'll just be. It's like it's a it's a fucking dessert, and it's like you're having that pre breakfast. Yeah, I mean you're literally putting sugar into it. I, I I like bitterness, as far as like flavor goes, not emotionally. <laughs> I was like, that's why I moved to Austin. I was sick of the bitterness of yeah. L.A. and New York. Same. But, but I but the like bitterness, like coffee or like a like. My alcohol, I would never have a mixed drink, ever. You'll never see me with a fruity fucking- With a little, with a Mai Tai? No. No? Or no. maybe The a... closest I get to that would be a margarita every now and then. And even a good margarita is more tang and bitter than yeah, it right. is- No, you're right. Sweet, right? Yeah. It's only the shitty ones that you get like, yeah. that taste like sugar ass. Yeah, and yeah. I hate those. I don't like them. I either. usually- uh, I, f- I find the good ones if I'm gonna get one, but I I really don't like. Um, Bro, if there's a bar with a pile of limes, you gotta get the margarita because they're squeezing those bitches yeah. fresh. Oh, yeah. Man, oh yeah, yeah, best. yeah. I love that shit. Yeah. But yeah, no, just straight whiskey with a one of them Same. fatty ice cubes. Oh those yeah. Big old. We have them in the office. I would have offered it. It's those. too early though. It's too God, early for no, that. No, I can't do that right now. What's the earliest you start drinking ever, dude? When I'm done with my spots. Okay. So yeah. like 11, 12. <clears throat> sure. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. And <clears throat> excuse me. And um. In LA, like I would never drink. Oh, some of this is sparkling water. No, I'm good. Okay. Cool. Um, I never drink there. I only started. I mean, I really only drink in the last. I've been here since uh, like uh, July, mm-hmm. and yeah, it's pr- probably the most I've consistently drank my entire life. Yeah. Like just in the last. Whenever I do mothership. Whenever I'm at the mothership. You kind of have to. It's fun. Right. It's fun. Yeah. Feel and I like... feel like it's like a reward there. And also, I live like a block away from mothership. Okay. So I just like. I'm not worried about driving or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Do we? Are we rolling already, Tony? Look at Tony's just fucking that's on how top we do, of it, man. bro. Just Organic. right into it. Matt Edgar, what's up, brother? Thank you for coming on the Thank podcast, you for dude. Me. I appreciate you. Um, so yeah, so you said you moved to Austin in July. You, so are you from LA? Yeah. Okay. So born and raised. Yeah. Nice, dude. And we, we got out of that West Coast shithole, dude. I'm from Oregon. So oh, are you? Yeah, I moved here July of 22. Okay. So, so probably around the same. Moved here on the 4th of July, dude. Oh, shit. Yeah, I moved here with my cats, two cats, two guns, and two ounces of weed, dude. Wow. Yeah, because I, I I, mean, you weren't allowed to take the weed, but you can check guns, Yeah. which was a weird experience for me. Cause you Did just, you drive here? No, I flew here. So and you I brought fl- your two cats? Two cats on the plane, Ooh. in the cabin. You get put medicine. You give oh, them medicine. Knocked them out. Yeah, yeah. Gabapentin. I had to do that too. They take human. Yep, they gabapentin. take human pills. Like, yeah. yeah. I didn't know. They're like, I'm like, really gabapentin? They're like, yeah, just throw it. But and they make it sound so easy. Just put it in their mouth. It's like it's like prying an alligator's jaws open. Oh, dude. To put the littlest pill in, and yeah. then every time they just go, and it's like mm. right on their tongue. You got to trick them. You got to put them in something else. It's they're not like, put dog. In like They're a... too smart for that shit. They're not like dog. I tried oh, putting it in a little piece of turkey or something, dude. They're not dogs. Would just. Doesn't my, matter what you fucking. Put my in boy it. fell right for it, man. Oh, your cat. I watched him. Yeah, and he was just like, he had no idea what he was doing. He yeah. was stoked, dude. Dad, you, thanks. I never eat this crap. Yeah, it's like junk food. Right. Thanks, Dad. It's like sugar, whatever it is. And that then they you go, just had to look at him and go, "I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's gonna suck." And then when they start to fade, 
You oh, can kind of see it in there. Their like little cat limbs don't really work anymore. Dude, I had my I had my hand in like under because you put them under the seat. Yeah, in front, in front of, of you. And yeah. I put my I had my hand in there the whole flight. Yeah, same. Just like pretty so much. You could just lay on my hand and. He was so good though. He was yeah. only bad on the drive there. I think he didn't really kick in yet. And then when the plane would take off and land, that mm-hmm. was it. In the air, totally cool. Yeah. It must be I think it must be like the bumpy road and shit. My yeah, cats yeah, my cats hate sure. the car, but the plane was cool and they were on drugs, so I don't know. Yeah. But uh but yeah, I remember I like we like put the cats up on the seat and they were like, Oh my god, there's fucking cats here the whole time. We didn't even know. Oh yeah. And then they woke up and they're like what the fuck is going on? Oh, I know. You know that's what I mean? so, that's yeah. jarring. Did you have to take your cat out at the TSA? Because that's an experience. Yep. yep. I you had to, do to like, scruff it, and then it's, like, and yeah. there's all these people and machines and, like, s- sounds and they shit. They took us to one of the private rooms, like, they nice. were to, like, look at my underwear. Yeah. And they, uh, one guy. He's got pussy. He had me. to look through the, you know, the bag and, and stuff, and I think I just held him. I think I held him yeah. while the guy looked. And, He's just, like, digging into your bag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and, the, and they're cool. The TSA agents that were doing that were like they're used to this shit. Because yeah. I was like not playing. Like no. I didn't I didn't like that at all. That like I get that you guys need to like look through this, but they wanted me to take him out, and he was yeah. so scared. Yeah, and it's, it's like didn't really the drugs didn't kick in yet. And it's like if this cat hits the ground, it's gone. It's, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone, dude. Yep. And it's it was funny too because I it was like six a.m. and we fucking pulled the cats out and we were looking at and they were starting to freak out like they were cool for a minute and then they were starting to like n- put, freak out and this big giant TSA lady is like I need those cats back in the carriers oh, right now bad attitude dude just like not well, the and right it's like you told us to fucking take them out anyway yeah let's just talk about let's cats let's just talk about dude. airports let's just talk about airports. comedians right yeah dude I mean I guess I am now I don't know I've been doing it for like a year so I'm like a year in. Mm. It's been it's been fun. It's been I think if you make a lot of people told me if you make it through the first year, then you know you're fucked up enough in the head to do. So it, I think I it's guess. like the first decade. The first decade, yeah. Oh yeah, because you know it's like the only performative art where to practice you just do it. There's no yeah. strumming your guitar in the in well, your like, bedroom. Yeah, my band my bandmates back home, uh, like my my drummer's super into it, and he's been like you know going to open mics, and I don't know what he's doing. I don't know why you know he's going to open mics and just like st- standing there wa- watching, and like he does like TikTok videos where he'll put like a, he'll write like a joke, and uh, like one of them was like it's just him like putting a zin in and going. <sighs> Like that's like his whole. It's like every video looks the same, and yeah, right. uh, and he's like, it, and some of them are funny. Like one of them's like when you bring the goth chick home from the bar, and she has a bigger dick than you. Like mm-hmm. just like quick little things like that. And it's like you can, I can tell that he like loves it and wants to do it. And I'm like, dude, you can't approach this like drums. Like I'm sorry, it's like you can't nerd out about this to the point where like you're good enough to like go do it. Like it's not like like he's used to like just playing the drums in a in a private room. And then he goes and is badass on stage with us. And it's like, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You got to go and be, you got to embarrass yourself first and yeah. like kind of fuck up and eat shit a bunch. You got to, you got to get to the point where you're not embarrassed. Right. Yeah. You got to get to or this. Or like, like that feeling. The comfort. Yeah. That feeling of being embarrassed doesn't really have an effect. Yeah. You and the like, side, you kind of have to get used to the silence and that's almost where the magic happens. Right. Mm-hmm. That's where you start to like, right. I'm learning all this like in real time. It's like so. tension. Like a laughter is just like. A laugh is just release of tension, and so like the silence is kind of building that tension. It's like, yeah. and then the the joke is the release valve. The punchline's like that. Dung, yeah, and it comes out. So you you need that. And that builds it. Yeah. How long have you been doing it? Seventeen. Seventeen years. Mm-hmm. Holy shit, dude. Yeah, so when did you get passed at the comedy store? What was that like? Uh, that was in two thousand eleven. I had been there for four years. I was a door guy. Okay. Yeah, I got there when I was, when I, so when I, I graduated high school, so I'm from, like, uh, like, Long Beach. Okay. Um, Specifically, there's this little town called Los Alamitos. It's, like, a suburb outside of Long Beach. Technically, Orange County, but it borders L.A. County. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a beach, Seal Beach, so like Los Al, Seal Beach, and then right to the west, the next town over is Long Beach. So like that's 30 miles from Hollywood. I graduated high school, and a week later I was driving to Hollywood uh, taking improv classes at the Groundlings. You know what the Groundlings is? No. The Groundlings is like this super uh, famous improv theater that like 
all your favorite SNL players came from, like Will Ferrell. Mm-hmm. Like I had, I was just obsessed with Will Ferrell when I graduated high school. I think I still am. To be I, I saw old school and it changed my life. Like, this, is, <laughs> this guy is the funniest. You're my boy, Blue. Yeah, I yeah. mean, dude, he sure, like awesome. he's special, man. But he, I was like, how? Where did this guy come from? And he's an Orange County dude, and okay. he went to U, he went to USC. Like, so he's a Southern Californian like me. Like, where did he go? And then I found out about the Groundlings, and that opened up a whole can of worms because. Everybody's from the Groundlings. Like so many of these people like that Jim I like. Jim Carrey and shit. Not Jim Carrey, but like so many like like uh, SNL like '90s SNL like guys. And I'm Sandler? sure still now. Nah, Chris but like Farley? N- none, none that you just listed. <laughs> <laughs> but like uh, you know, like like uh, Chris Kattan, oh, Chris yeah, Parnell, yeah. Sherry O'Terry, Anna Gasteyer. Like my, a I love the, the uh, '90s SNL. John Lovitz. Oh, nice. Um, what about Phil Hartman? Phil Hartman, he's a big Groundlings guy. Legend. That was like, he's a Groundlings legend. Every Christmas, I watch Jingle All the Way, dude. Oh, Phil yeah. Hartman's in that. He's, he, that's he's like, amazing. I feel like there's like guys that are like every, maybe every generation has that. I think Will Ferrell was my Phil Hartman. Yeah, same. You know How old are you? I'm 38. 38. Okay, a couple yeah. years older than me. So I started taking Groundlings classes, and that led to like private improv lessons with this guy called Kip King. He was uh, one of the Sounds original kind of groundlings. To me, well, he's know. Chris Kattan's dad, oh. and so like he taught these these private lessons, and then it kind of became more of like I started to help. He's an old man at the time, and so like he would like he wouldn't charge me if I'd come over to his house and help him with shit. Like he was mm-hmm. old, he had like bad knees, so like I would help him do stuff. But then it turned way less about improv. Well, it was about improv, but it was more like like this like Eastern philosophy he was a buddhist he was like a <laughs> true buddhist Crazy. started off jewish but then he's like completely buddhist and he'd give me books and he would teach me things about this culture and i never really was in any any of that sort of stuff but that kind of like it was interesting how he compared buddhism to improv and like there's like a lot of similarities so like, like what well it's all like being in the moment True. It's all about just like Be where your hands are. Just well, it's all like the less is more. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And like just kind of like letting letting more happen, like relinquishing the control and knowing when like you're you know it's time to act. And um, but it was just like all these cool things. And so I did that for a few years. I always thought I would get into stand up as soon as I turned twenty one because those were the rules. Like mm-hmm. there was nothing that was like 18 and up it was all like seemingly 21 years old so as soon as i turned 21 the comedy store i i mean i was always going to do that i mean i was going to be a comedian when i was eight i I had a my stepdad got a sinbad album and it was like what the fuck is this and then i got all the i had i I had like cool comedy taste in high school my friends were listening to bands so was i but i had like chris rock albums nobody probably thought that was cool a few of my friends. Did. I had funny <laughs> friends, man. Yeah. I had the funniest friends. Those guys, and I, they're still my friends now, and they think this is all super cool. Oh, I bet. But they, um, they, yeah, we would listen to comedy albums, and uh, I just took that shit seriously. Yeah. And so I feel like I was kind of in my friend group too, like an early adopter. And again, it kind of like you said, it was something I always knew that at some point I would do. Oh yeah, it's only. I time. felt like whenever I would think about doing it when I was younger, I felt. I mean, I grew up in like like a a decent. It was, it was like an upper middle class suburb. Of, like there was still the rich people up on the hill, mm-hmm. but we were like in a good, still a nice area, suburb area yeah. of or of Portland. So it was like. I just felt like I didn't have enough like real life experience. Like sure. I was the only child. I didn't even have siblings I could talk. So I'm like, what am I? See? You know, it's like I got old. I got older. I lived with my girlfriend for like ten years. We've been together for a long time, and it's like now I have maybe something to talk about. Well, you, you know, know I mean? it's I funny know. you mention that because like when I started, like me and all my friend, all the guys that started, like I mean, you know, a lot of them now. There's still a lot of them are still around, and uh, and we all like were very young and, and wide eyed. And we were learning stand up, like by doing mics and just sucking ass. It yeah. was horrible. But the older guys, and when I say older, probably like people that were like thirty when we're like you know early twenties. These guys are like probably early thirties or and up. Those guys when they started, they were immediately better than all of us because they did have not only more experience, they had more to talk about, but they had more comfort in themselves. Yeah, you know, where I was still like super insecure, scared. Mm-hmm. I was scared. You know, and then I'm thrown into this like very adult world, which is not when I say adult world. I mean, they're a bunch of Peter Pans. I mean, <laughs> especially back then, the comedy store in 2007 when I got there was dead. Really? Was dead. 
I mean, they wouldn't even be able to start the shows if there weren't at least six people in, in the audience. Yeah. So sometimes we would just sit there and then like wait for another customer to come in and then I we feel could like finally start seen it. that happen at a couple like a couple like you know Tuesday nights here like at Creek or something. But imagine that that happening at the comedy store and the the comedians the paid regulars back then were all your favorite comedians now. They're just not famous at all. That's why. Like all I mean, these that's guys. that's kind of what we're seeing with like I mean people like you even or people like you know there's people like the new the door guys at the comedy store or mm -hmm. at the mothership I mean are like the, the next yeah some of those no guys doubt. are some of those guys oh are I see there. myself in them all the time and that's like the cool thing that I'm really loving right now was is that like it reminds me of when I was a door guy and there'd be a cooler older paid regular that I'd look up to and like like some of these guys like you know some of them would come into t would like at the store someone would move to LA from New York or some or like fr from another place and they'd be so good and they get right into the system and they're in like I would go I would watch them as a door guy I'd go run in there to watch Sebastian I'd take like right. a 15 minute break who got huge right now yeah but back then he was going up in front of like 20 people and destroy and he, dude, it felt like the comedy store back then felt like a secret Felt like the secret underground thing that nobody knows the magic that's happening in here. Yeah, I mean, there's no back. There's no security. No, like, I mean, we were like the door guys ran it. Like yeah. we ran the asylum. <laughs> and uh, you're just herding cats all the time. And, like, I, and <laughs> trying to get these crazy. There's this in. guy, Al, you know, Al Madrigal. I don't think so. No. Well, okay. So stand up. When I when I first was debating whether I wanted to move here, um, I talked to Hinchcliffe who's my best friend, we started together, like, in, we started, like, within a week of each other mm -hmm. in 2007. We used to live together. We we were obsessed with stand-up the same. And yeah. we still, like, to this day, talk about it just like the kids we were back then. But um, he was already very established here and had been baiting me to come out, da, 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 and I sure. finally came out, and I loved I went. I did the mothership. I did, uh, uh, you know, I did the crew show because I mm -hmm. didn't know. And then Adam... Adam, who books Mothership, was my talent coordinator at the Comedy Store. You I've known him know for a long other, time, yeah. right? But yeah, I feel like I still had to showcase. I feel like he hadn't seen me in a while. You and had to show that you still had your chops. Yeah, yeah. And there's yeah. a pandemic had happened between the times that he had seen me. So there's you know a lot I mean? of people taking time off. Or, yeah, or I didn't. I was doing yeah. illegal shit during nice, the pandemic dude. the entire You're time. Such a punk rock. Star. Yeah, dude. I was in oh, Vegas yeah. and I was in L. I mean, I was doing shady shit. Nice. But uh, <laughs> but I um, I got a I got a taste of it and like. I really want and I and I told I asked Tony I was like man how do you get in here because if I were to get in at this club like I'd probably move like this is so fun you know yeah. and it's in the middle of the country so I can also just f easily get anywhere you know what I mean it like make a lot of sense and then you kind of don't have to when you have so much dang going stage on time. here yeah, right so much dope stage time it's like unless it's a sweet offer he made such a great point and I still think about it and I actually think it's the best advice that I that anyone could give any young comedian but just anybody that's starting off in a scene in any kind of music or whatever. anything yeah um so i'm like how do i get into the mothership and he's and he said the question isn't how do you get into the mothership the question is what can you bring to the mothership like the mothership doesn't owe me anything i it's a it's a potluck i gotta yeah. bring something to get right. anything back and that that goes for that's everyone that's huge dude. that's that's huge so i started thinking and it reminded me of this guy, Al Madrigal, who started off as a Bay Area comedian. Great stand-up. I mean, like, one of the best. All your favorite comedians love him. I mean, he's like, now I think he's like more of a actor. I'm going to look him up. What's, yeah, Al, Al Madrigal. Is it all one word? No. Okay. Al Madrigal. Madrigal. Yep. Okay. Yep. Cool. And he, uh, um, when he got to the, when he got to the comedy store, he was already pretty developed. This was before my time. I think Steve Renazizi and Ari Shafir were telling me about the way they looked up to him because he they were door guys, which those guys are my paid regulars that I look up to. So this is like, you know how like stars go, like you could see the depth, you know what yeah. I mean? Like this is like way back in the timeline when they were coming up, Al Magical moves to, to LA, gets passed at the store, and this guy was already developed. He had he had a, he had a very cool conversationalist style, but very written. Like it, yeah. like it's it almost the lines blurred as is this a joke or not? And just super well, great speaker, just very just articulate. And he was super. His jokes were intricate, very just 
masterful. Uh, but when he got to the comedy store, it changed the culture. Like these guys, these kids looked up to him and then they started acting like him. And he was just like this cool, maybe a little bit older than them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just but more developed. And he brought something to the comedy store. And I just thought about that like, yeah, man, I would love to be a, a guy like that that would come into this new scene <clears throat> um, with all the experience I have without the bitterness. I'm not a bitter guy. I'm loving this shit. Yeah. Um, you don't have like a chip on your shoulder like, hell no. like some people do. When, when, we they... start, when we started, there was a lot of that. There's all these older guys like, comedy's dead, you're late. Like right. we're all losers, or what you guys are doing isn't comedy, right? right? Or they only like fucking, you know, what I, I mean, dice people, or something. Well, it was just like it was like people that were just not that good, but they were older and they had been there and they had just not succeeded and they just thought that's what comedy was and we're all just yeah. losers here. And I was like, we, you know, yeah. and m me and my friends starting out were like stoked. Like, why are you guys bummed about this shit? This is so fucking cool. Yeah. But they were like a decade or two older than us. Just, they were beaten, you know? Yeah. And I knew that this is a young, fresh scene. Most of these guys are so young. And I, uh, like, I, I, I could keep up with that energy. That's my kind. I love that shit. And if I could come here and, like, you know, just set a good example and be a, another positive, you know, I guess now I'm, like, one of the older guys here. And uh, if I could do that and we could all just grow and support each other and make it an actual community, like it's not yeah. like that in L.A. It's like every man for himself. How is it? How's it? How in what ways is it different? Like, I just think I've that never the, been to, I've never really hung out in L.A. I've mm -hmm. never been to the comedy store before. I think it's the Hollywood aspect does a lot. You know, it's like it's show business. It's a right. cutthroat, mean, cold business that I think that like it just it just creates this culture of scarcity. You know what I mean? Like, like they're a all feast or famine kind of thing. Yeah, or, yeah. And so everybody's like, like trying. Everybody thinks they're competing with each other. Yeah. They're not, but they think they are. You, well, and actually, in a lot of ways, maybe they are because they're auditioning for the same shit. So there, sure. there's that, or they're trying to get the writing packet in, and everybody's yeah. working on the same you know sh packet to turn in at the end of the week. And it, it's just it's like that there here. Just like everybody seems to love stand up so much that. They don't really care about what other people are doing, except for like that's cool if you're doing that or oh, what do you talk that joke about? I, dude, this is a, this is a great thing about this scene is that I see more guys talking about material than than other comedians. They're actually talking about the things they should be talking about. Like the hey, work. when you said that, what if you did this? And yeah. they're like, oh, I'm gonna try that. And then when you said that, you could do it this way. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. they're workshopping stuff versus like, hey, that wasn't that guy. Well, wasn't it's funny like or... if you're a bunch of funny people and you guys are all gonna talk about funny shit anyways, and then somebody has something that's funny and inspires an idea into you, and, and then you're like, oh man, I was just thinking. Like sometimes it hits me later. Like I'll watch a guy. And then, like, as the week goes on, it's just like I'm, I'm like thinking. And then the next time I see him, I'm like, bro, I can't stop thinking about your joke about this. And then, yeah. and then we start riffing. And he's like, oh, could I say that? I was like, fuck yeah, yeah. Like that's what I wanted to bring to this scene, and uh, you know, it's worked out great. I love it. I mean, these guys are so. These kids are fucking great. There's They're so funny. many good. Stand I. It's crazy because like I, I used to be so into i mean i'm still into metal but i kind of have my like you know and i'm in a metal i like to it's a weird thing with the metal thing now that i've gotten older i like to do it more than i like to like consume it it's this weird like mm -hmm. i like to get up on stage and like oh, yeah. do it and i like to record music and and work on songs in my band but then like when i go to listen to music i've just been like listening to all kinds of old shit like old 90s rock and yeah. like old like you're not listening shit. to the music you're I'm playing i'm not listening to like the new stuff that's mm -hmm. coming out as much and and i think i have like I know more comedians now because I've I've gotten so into comedy since mm -hmm. I moved since like bef right before I moved here and then when I moved here it was just like going yeah. to the mothership and going to Vulcan and then starting to do mics and doing it and be meeting these guys and then it makes it makes uh like when when somebody gets on Kill Tony or something I'm like oh hell yeah get it Paul you know or like yeah. one of these guys I'm like sick you know what I mean it's cool to see your homies people that you know your peers go up and crush or do bad yeah I think it I think when uh, you're in L A especially like you you feel you almost can't it's almost like a maladaptive defense mechanism that like you 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 almost can't be happy for your friend's success because you're 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 trained to think that that takes away from you and there's that's only that because that's there's it's only because it's always been that way so when you get there like it kind of the wide-eyed optimism kind of gets slapped out of you yeah 
unless you have a fucking lion heart like me and I never lost it. I think I think there are times when I was probably a little bit more sensitive and there's times when I was probably a little on the road to bitterness, but a little more of a hater or close not, to being there. <laughs> I mean, I could see why people would hate on, but then I just it never went anywhere and like man, there ain't nothing better than writing a new joke. We Rogan, we were talking about it uh we were talking about it last night at Mothership. It's like like the best feelings that you could feel is sex and then new joke. And then and then he would, Joe's like, well, sometimes it's new joke and just shitty sex. Right. You know what I mean? Sex could actually come secondary and it's to like a new Ooh. joke. Yeah. 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 I had a moment like it was I think in within my you know, as my my young uh my young comedy career or whatever just like i've only been doing it doing mics for like a year and i haven't been working as hard as you know i see other people so it's like maybe six months if we're being you know mm -hmm. if we're being honest it's like i've i had my my little moment where i was like oh fuck like i did good like yeah. like la this week right i had that i'm like at a shitty open mic you yeah. know what i mean and it was like and and that, i was like oh and that's like it's like the addiction just gets worse and mm -hmm. worse. With oh comedy. yeah, you get a little taste. Yeah, it, it took me forever to have that when when I first started. Yeah, we wanted that was one of the questions I wanted to ask is do you if like the first time if you have a story about, like the first time you crushed. Oh God, that I, you can no. remember? No, Not that I, I can't. I remember like it. It was a long time. I remember the feelings of like sometimes if I actually got to a point where I was doing like pretty good and getting laughs i would become conscious and it would fuck it up like oh in my head i'd be like dude i'm, I'm, I'm doing, doing it, it. I'm doing it. <laughs> you ever try to hit a speed bag no like these speed bags it's like this one there's a rhythm yeah there's a rhythm right. to it but there's something that like there's this block at least for me and i and i bet you you get past that when you're like a pro but like you start going and then you once you get excited that it's actually working like you fumble good, good, the bag good. yeah oh, yeah um would you say you fumbled the bag a lot of times, dude? I, I might have bombed for a decade. Like before, I, I before think you that got, before you got good. Yeah, I mean, I got past four years in, so there was that. So I was thrown into like deep waters. I got past before anybody in my. Uh, first of all, I was the worst. I was definitely the worst door guy comedian, no doubt. I had zero confidence. I think I might have had a little bit of just natural. Like, I think we start off with certain things. You know, even in music, like. There's certain things that you kind of have natural just going for you, and then you can build off of. For me, I had a, uh, I had a natural ability to connect, and I also understood the importance of connection with the connecting with the, with the crowd. Connecting, yeah. Because if you could connect, you could you get way more leeway. Mm -hmm. Like it's you could actually do worse, but if you're dialed in with them, they kind of go with you to an extent. You know what yeah. I mean? I, I think that I first started getting good. To be real, like I, there's. It's so funny you ask that because there's just glimpses of it that I remember, and there was one specific. It was just this up this bar show, this bar had an upstairs room, and it was on Sunset. It was a block down from the store, and I was bombing like usual, and uh, but like something would happen when I would bomb where I would get funny, almost like making fun of how bad this is going. Yeah, was like a safe space for me because I had nothing else. Like anything I tried to come up with or any plan I had went out the window immediately right. and then I was just like up against the wall and those reactions were like the first laughs I would get and this guy pulled me aside and he's like dude you know like I don't mean this as an insult but you're really good at bombing <laughs> <laughs> no I mean that it's like you're yeah. actually when you bomb it's like you turn it on like yeah. something clicks when I it's like I, that fear or that discomfort pushed you into this place yeah this exactly and, and at the store back then there were bullies the older yeah. guys that would like so we would get like two spots these like little three minute spots Sunday and Monday it was like our nights mm -hmm. and uh, there was these guys the guys that were like a little bit older than me that had had been there they would host it and they would just they were so mean man they were like this next guy's the worst if you guys have to use the restroom now's the chance we call him the restroom break comedian oh my God. this guy you know and then and, and <laughs> they would stand the in the back they would ever. stand in the back and fire off and kill it they would kill it while i'm on stage making fun of me and i would just be left with nothing like who like was this were you there when like was patrice was there right no patrice or, or was wasn't that, a store guy okay but yeah, I do. I've I've had experiences yeah. with him there. Yeah. yeah, he was a New York guy, but oh, he would yeah. come through. Um, he yelled at me one night. <laughs> Damn, it hurt my feelings. <laughs> hey, that's kind of a fucking like. But then he apologized. Legendary. That's kind of legendary though. Yeah, the like, legendary part is, I used to I used to park cars. That was my job there. I was like a valet. Yeah, yeah, kind of like the the comedians who were paid regulars could park there, and uh, 
one night, I mean, it would get so busy that there's only one way in and out of this tiny little parking lot. And it was like Tetris, like, like, and I had it down to a science. Like I knew how many cars to put here, what size cars, which who do I need to get out? Like I would keep tabs because Mm -hmm. if it was too busy, you would have to pull cars out and literally park them on the sidewalk, like where people are walking just to get a car out. Right. And one night I was doing this and I pulled a car up and right in front of me is Patrice O'Neill. He didn't realize that I was trying to park the car kind of where he's standing. Mm -hmm. And he just saw me coming up on the sidewalk He's like, what are you doing? What the fuck are you doing? And he just starts te- teeing off. And I'm looking. I'm like, that's one of my favorite comedians. He does not get <laughs> He's just that. yelling at you? He's yelling at me. I'm like holding back tears. Yeah. And then I I bring all the cars in. And maybe an hour later, he walks up to me. He's like, hey, man, I, as, a, as a man, man to man, I want to say I'm sorry. Oh, damn. I didn't realize what you were doing. Somebody explained to me. And uh, from one man to another, I apologize. And it was like that's cool. totally worth being yelled at right. to get to that. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. what a cool, intimate, like a man. This guy seems mean. Mm-hmm. You know, he's that's one of the of most hardcore image. comedians. Yeah, and this guy's he's actually he's actually there's a there's a piece of him that's a little bit sensitive that was yeah. able to be like, oh, I, f- I was mean to this kid. I bet you there's a lot of people he didn't apologize. Hell to. no, <laughs> he probably owes a lot of apologies. <laughs> right. But uh, never happened. But yeah, so I you know like I think um, get you know getting made fun of. By the comics in the back who are way funnier than me, and then having to respond to that, and then getting pushed, just not doing good, and, and like, but learning in that bad place when I didn't have a plan, I was like more free. Yeah, and that was like the little seed I was able to build off of. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff I'm trying to like slowly pick up on and learn. I'm just trying to like talk to people like you and learn basically through you know what you guys have been through. Yeah, you I mean, know, there's something, how, and there's so many good comics. You know, even hanging out with, with Ridley, you know, it's like he's been doing it for a long time. And I just, I feel like I, I can like, uh, there's so many, there's so much opportunity here to like absorb information and just watching people kill, you know, it's like, that's the thing with metal. Like a lot of people get big and they stop going to shows as much, like, unless they're playing them. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? And like here, it's like, I kind of notice some of like the open mic guys, they don't necessarily watch a lot of like a lot of, they don't go, they don't pay to go. Maybe they don't have the money, but Mm -hmm. they don't go to like the bigger shows. Yeah. And it's like, I'm still at this point where like, yeah, I'm trying to do it, but I'm also like still a fucking fan of of the sport. You you, you You can't lose that. Like, that's the thing. It's when, when you, when I feel like I can't like not, not writing new jokes. I'm not feeling funny. I'm not feeling inspired. Well, that's, you just need inspiration. So right. you got to go back to your roots, like being a fan again. I don't care if that's like putting on an album or putting on, yes. you know, what's great about now is everything's on Eclipse. I could mm-hmm. literally just scroll and find some of my favorite comedians or find new comedians. But like, you know, comedy clubs are usually really cool about letting comedians come in at any level. You could yeah. be a weak old comedian and they'll let you sit in the back and watch. And if you're blessed to be in a scene like, you know, where there's like the best comedians in the world are there, you kind of get this free ticket to always watch that. You know, I would go, I would treat it like it was like college. Like I would go to, you know, Ari Shafir class and watch, you know, Professor Trade Ari school. go up and yeah. And then like, or anybody that I would just like, I kind of looked up to and uh, learn from the best. And mm-hmm. that would inspire me to write and like, Sometimes I just walk away like, oh, yeah, fuck yeah. I'm like, yeah. I'm feeling it again. I did that, That like, I found out that all the old Comedy Central Presents are on, like, Paramount Plus or something mm-hmm. like that. And so I just went and started, because that's where I, I mean, I'm a little bit younger. I don't know, you know, yeah. you, you might have started with, like, records and stuff. But for me, it was, like, no, down, was downloading up. Dane Cook mm-hmm. Comedy Central Presents on fucking, the, you know. The Black on, Tank Top? The one where he does the alien yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah, that one. And, like, the old Nick Swartz and stuff. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I, you know, yeah. Chappelle, Chappelle's show. We used to watch Chappelle show as a family, which, totally. in retrospect, is kind of weird. My parents it's would be good like, art. come on down for Chappelle, honey. It's on in 10. You Dude, know? it's, it's a like, great show. Like, shout I'd, out to I'd my watch, parents for I'd that. watch that with my kids. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Show them what funny shit is. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. But it's like, I, that was the first time I ever saw a white person stereotype. And I was like, oh, that's what other people think of us. That's yeah. fucking awesome. Yeah. Chappelle's Chip. white guy was my Chip. favorite. Chip. Chip. Yeah, was yeah. that his name? I Chip. didn't know I couldn't do that. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, officer. I, yeah. I, that's so good. Yeah. And uh, his, uh, I forget what the news anchor was. Was that Chip, too? Is that his name, too? I don't the, know. I forget. But I know what you're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. I always like the draft. Remember the draft? The racial draft. draft. Yeah. With Bill, Bill Burr. Burr. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. dude. 
Going back and watching some of that shit is fucking. And it still it's, hits. It's great because it's only two seasons. Like you could yeah. just. Those are the best sketch comedy shows. The two seasons. You ever watch the Ben Stiller show? No. It's like that. It's like two seasons what? or something. I oh yeah. Know he had a show. See. I don't know how this holds up now. I mean, this was like in the '90s, but still and comedy is very out. much of the time. So like, mm-hmm. comedy doesn't. It's like an avocado. It's great. <laughs> When you when it's ripe, when you, you crack know? it open, but then he, if you leave it out too long, you, right. you'll get sick. Oh yeah. But uh, but then there's timeless comedy like um, Chappelle show seems pretty timeless. I don't know. I, just I feel like have the you kids gone back now. And I feel like kids don't like him. Maybe I feel like he's maybe. becoming like this. Like I don't know. I haven't seen the new one. I haven't seen the new one. Um, yeah. but I feel like the young kids. Like yeah, I just see. I just just see on Twitter. Like I just see how people like shit on him now like I feel he like, was like the hero yeah oh yeah for right. sure i feel like uh after doing stand-up stuff and like going to open mics and and uh and like watching so much club stand-up like intimate shows at mm-hmm. like the little room and like the all of the kill tony rogan shows that happened uh at vulcan before it almost kind of like spoils spoils me in a weird way where like when i go to watch a special it's like something totally different than oh yeah than how i remember watching them when i was a kid yeah and i do remember like still being into like delivery and like like all these little things that I felt like none of my friends were thinking of when they were yeah. watching this shit. With no me. doubt, you're you know not I mean? thinking about it. That's the nuanced stuff that you learn when you get into it. Yeah. I I used to think that you just go up and be funny. That's what everybody thought, you know. But well, there's that's, a lot of people still think that. Yeah, but there is actually rhythms to it. Oh yeah, and and the words kind of not. I mean, I don't want to say the words don't matter, but it's almost like. It's almost like more the placement of the words, the, the ca- economy, the, and stuff the economy. I think Seinfeld calls it word economy, mm-hmm. where it's like how many words because a setup has to be has to be enough tension to where there's excitement. And it's like where the punch is at after the setup is going to dictate how hard the laugh is. So you have to have the setup just long enough for whatever the punchline is going to be has to have enough of an impact. Mm-hmm. So you could do like quick setup punch jokes. And those are quick. They almost sound like da 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 da. And that was that would be like a setup punch. I set it up, and then the punch, but da 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 da. You know. Yeah, I'm finding that I'm not that kind of comedian. No, me neither. And I actually, I'm more of a fan of that kind. I'm more of a fan of the kind of that I can't do. I mean, it's not that I can't. It just takes more of a. It takes more. It's harder for me when I go to New York. Uh, it's a lot. There's a lot of that there. Like New York has New York's like a different beast because it's such a fast city that their jokes that like you know like hip hop is like faster there than the West Coast stuff. You get Snoop in, right from Long Beach, but then you get like um, like, like who, Big L from the East Coast, and it's like quicker yeah. or Nas. It's like yeah. quicker, right? So like I think comedy's like that. Where like maybe in L. A. It's a little bit slower and melodic, and it leans more on the the uh the the it, maybe it leans more on the setup whereas like in New York it's more like punchlines they they want punches and bunches and make it quick yeah. so sometimes I'll go to, sometimes I'll go to New York and stay there for a while and then work on try that. To work on that you know what I mean because yeah. I I, th- I think the best is balance and having it all oh yeah you know for sure and so um they you know styles that's what's beautiful about this art form is that you, you kind of just, you create, you learn how to do it, and then you find your own way of doing it. And and when you really find your own way to do it, it, it sounds like your own thing. And mm-hmm. it's like almost like people can't steal unless it's like it's blatantly they're taken from you. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I, I've always enjoyed the guys that can write a good, quick joke. Yeah. I think it's so impressive. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but then I like a guy like... Quick shit. Like... Um, I mean, there's so many guys I'm liking right now. Like, Brian Simpson is, like, a very good, like... Brian's awesome. Yeah, I mean, he could just, like, he'll take you in. He'll sit there. He'll start talking conversationally. But the next thing you know, he's got you, and you don't even realize that that he's taking you to the punchline. Right. That's and like about the time you start to realize what he's taught, what he's getting at, mm -hmm. he hits you with it. Yeah. Like like, he hits you with it right before you're like, wait a minute, and then he fucking gets Mm -hmm. you with it. Yeah, I've been going to. We go to bottom of the barrel a lot. Oh yeah. It's kind of. I think it's the hack for people. Like it's it's kind of the hack to getting mothership tickets, right? Because it's like because the people don't realize like that show doesn't the late show you can almost always like a lot of people 
a lot of times you can get tickets to that. Like really? Yeah, like last minute. Like it's one of the it's one of the last ones I feel like that sells out. Like we can always get tickets like usually a day before huh. day like earlier day of, and like and we, so we'll we'll go to that one a lot because we've seen I've seen a lot of the comics. You know what I mean? It's like it's fun um, to see how they do stuff differently. That was mm-hmm. one of the first things I picked up when I would go to a bunch of shows. I started going to a bunch of shows out here. It's like. Like people like uh, Derek Poston, like every time he does a bit, it's like new to me, mm-hmm. you know. But then the, there's other stuff where you're like, oh, I've seen this before. But that's why I like Bottom of the Barrel because it's that improv, yeah, fucking, you know. And so Brian's always there, and that shit is awesome, dude. Like, yeah, he's, totally. He crushes. Um, but uh, but yeah, dude. Uh, so it's it's crazy. It sounds. I didn't realize that you've been doing it for that long for 17 years. Yeah. So you've you're just you never you never did any like music thing or you weren't you didn't try to do anything else no. for it was just stand up stand up mm-hmm. yeah I mean you know I think I uh, took an acting class at one point but I just didn't I don't know I just thought that like stand up was I mean I was always a funny kid I love when you know school I was always like getting the laughs in the classroom the communal la- get the whole class to laugh. Right, yeah. since as lo- far back as I can remember, like kindergarten, like y- having the group of people laugh at the same time, um, that was just my shit. And yeah. then when I found, when I first discovered stand up was a thing, um, I could not like imagine doing anything else. That was seemed like the most fun you could have in life. Yeah. What was like the first first dude that, or like the first comedian that made you? F- I I I, ca- I gotta I gotta give it to Sinbad just because this album that my um my family we were taking like a family road trip or something and we were f- visiting my stepdad's family and then when we left to drive back I think they're in Utah and we left to drive back to California so it's a long drive yeah um on the way like right before we left my dad's cousin was like oh you gotta listen to this guy it was like a cassette and he threw it in like midway through the drive and it was Sinbad. And I don't remember it. I just remember going, what the fuck? (laughs) Like, these are, like, grown-ups, and they're just, like, goofing off. Like, and, like... I didn't think that was allowed. Yeah. (laughs) But not only allowed, like, this guy lives off of it. This guy's... This guy is, like, there's a career, you know? Yeah, he's famous from it. Yeah. And then, you know... I don't think I've ever really watched any of some bad stuff. I need to go back and watch it, dude. Dude, There's a lot of the old stuff I haven't watched, because I came up in that... That like Comedy Central presents. How old are you? I'm thirty. It's gonna be thirty three like mm. next week. Yeah, I mean Comedy Central presents. I just didn't like it because I felt like it was too edited. Mm-hmm. Anything where they had to prepare for a commercial and they cut it off. Yeah. I just think that's you're just pissing on the art. But uh, I mean, it was the best they could do back then. So sure. you know, at least there was that. Um, the best way to 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 take and stand up is either there, or the second best is the the album because there. It's less distracting, at least for me. Maybe everybody's different, but for me, when I watch a special or something, like I'm getting distracted by the guy or the girl. Like I'm watching them, their and, mannerisms, and, and, stuff. and then and it's shots of the crowd, and then it just. But they're right. in a theater, and then it's two or three shows. But I'm not there. Together. I'm like watching people watch them. Yeah. Right. Whereas, like an album, I could throw it on and like see what they're saying. I could go with them. Mm. It's theater of the mind. Yeah. It's to me. It's just the next best way. Are people still doing that? Like, I don't are people think so, still? Man. It's kind of like you're. It's almost like when a metal band nowadays like drops a cassette tape, right? Isn't it kind of like a? I a just nod, hope that, a nod to the old school. I just. I don't. I don't know if people are still consuming it that way. I think the biggest way, obviously, right now is clips. You know, with yeah. on these apps like these TikTok clips. I mean, that's like you go down a rabbit hole. Um. Yeah. There's the Netflix special. There's specials, YouTube specials, but. I don't think I don't hear about albums. I would just hope that anybody that makes a special would also release the audio. Kind of smart if you just put it. You on might Spotify. as you might as well. And uh, I do think that if I think if you're a fan or or not, I just think if you're driving somewhere or mm-hmm. you're on a plane or like, it's a great way to consume it. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I need to go back and listen to some of those. I used to listen to like you know, so I used, I owned like a couple of, and I know it's like he's I guess hacky now. People think, but like the the old Dane Cook stuff, mm-hmm. like that was my era. Oh yeah, when man. I was the, in high um, school. I was like a freshman. If swallowed. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I retaliation. Owned that. Retaliation. Yeah, mm-hmm. I had both of those. And I was, that was a, the shit, dude. Yeah. Having those, having those, uh, 
having those fucking hard CDs, just throw them in the car or something yeah. like that. Dude. That guy went like double platinum or what something. What happened those... to him? What was, because I, I don't, I didn't keep up with him. It just seemed like he disappeared and then like nobody really taught. Every, if, if you do hear people talk about mm-hmm. him, it's kind of not in the mm-hmm. best, not in the best light. I mean, I've heard things and I'm not going to perpetuate yeah, yeah, it, yeah, but, yeah. but I will, but I will say that I think anybody that hits the top of anything like that, it seemingly suddenly, it wasn't. He was 15 years in before we even know who he is. Right. But he got so famous in a time when that wasn't happening for stand up. And I think anybody that gets that famous, um, I think you, you become, you just become like, you just get become you hated. Get weird. Well, I just or, think or, it's like, oh, okay. I just think that's jealous. the way people are. I think that's the way audience, casual audiences are. You know what I mean? I think it's, it's like, music too. you get so big and then you kind of become a joke of yourself. You know, like George Carlin in the 80s was, was, a, there, it was a mockery of himself. Really? But yeah, everybody made fun of, like, he's the word guy. And you just like, the way that they would, Rick Moranis had a great impression of him that I think ruined it. I think it ruined George Carlin. George Carlin from the 70s was this cool countercultural like right just you know he was it was cool college kids liked him it was like everything that like, stand up t- he comedy. was taking on the man kind he was of, right? yeah um with his own style his own his own wordsmith style but then he kind of tried to keep doing he didn't i don't think he evolved the way i think he was just trying to like capitalize on what he had going Copy, and then like people kind of after a while people are going to see through the cracks and then if you're that famous you're gonna get made fun of on, you know. Because it's like you can't really complain about the man when you're like rich. You are the fun. man. Yeah, you become kinda, the man. Right. You're you're like working for the man, and 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 then like he had a resurgence, you know. And it's just like he took a t- time off, or or maybe didn't take time off, but he wasn't in the limelight. He was probably always doing spots because that guy was like a, like a junkie like me and anyone else. Yeah. But he. You know, like he took it. He went back to basics and started making new specials. And his last. You know, decade or two of comedy specials weren't anything like that. He wasn't doing as much of the wordy things, maybe a little bit here and there, but like it was more just like new ways of him telling jokes, and he be, kind of became that thing again. Because like, like I the, the Carlin I know is like an old man, mm-hmm. but the Carlin that was be, was making it and changing the world was this young dude that just like kind of a hippie, still kind of had hair and he had a beard and he just looked. I related to him because, he, I mean, he was like, uh, he was talking about stuff that people weren't talking about, like being a germaphobe, and it was, I thought that was interesting. And Like, like making fun of an, He was talking about anxiety. I mean, he was just talking about, like, different cool stuff. But this was before I was even born, yeah. you know what I mean? And then, like, while I was, um, I mean, I don't think I really even got into him until, like, the 2000s when I'm, like, really trying to become really trying to like study the right shit i think that i i desperately need to do that like i need to go back and watch like a bunch of old stuff that i never watched you yeah know what i mean like a bunch of stuff my, my dad was like an og richard Pryor fan had all the records and stuff and yeah. like i need to go back and just, just watch live in that. concert yeah richard Pryor li- live in concerts at the long beach auditorium mm-hmm. he it's two sh- it, it was recorded over two shows the first show he bombed he bombed and so, like, how do you bomb? I, yeah, when you're I that think big. I want to say it was Patty Labelle, and I hope I'm cor- I hope I'm correct. But it was like some musician opened for him from that day, like a famous mu- musician mm-hmm. from that time. And, was that the seventies, uh, eighties? Ah, man, that had to been like seventies. Seventies. Yeah. And he, um, so like he bombs the first show, and then in between shows, he's getting restless. He just wants back at him. Like he's just he just bombed in his special. He's the mm-hmm. biggest comedian on the planet, and he just like lost. And he wants to get back in there, and like Patty Labelle gets off stage, off the stage. I think people were like going out, getting drinks, or getting their snacks, and they're coming. You know, the the house lights were on, like in the whole auditorium, and he's just like, "Fuck it, I can't wait!" And he just walks out. And as he walks out, like people start cheering, but all the lights are on. It doesn't look like the show's about to start. He just walks out on stage, and you see a sea of people running down. And he's like firing shots out of all of them, just like boom. And the photographers, boom. Nah, nah, he's nah, nah. roasting everybody as they're coming down <laughs> to, to find their seats and like. It was a and live that, in concert, and he destroys, and it becomes like the iconic Richard Pryor concert. And that kind of comes from that what you were talking about earlier that 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 yep. like moment of discomfort when you're not doing well. Yeah, right? when you when you have to when the plans that you when 
when you when you make a plan, you plan for the moment that's not there yet. You don't know what the moment's going to be like. You could predict based off previous moments, but you don't really know. And so, like, yeah, man, he fucking found out and then turned it around. And then the same thing happened to him. There's another album live on the Sunset Strip. Same fucking thing. Only it was two nights. The first night he bombed, which was the night that all the celebrities came. It's on Sunset. The Palladium, it's just like iconic venue on Sunset. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he bombed the first night, and then he had to go a whole 24 hours stewing about it. Oh. And that was when, like, all the celebrities were at. Like, it's just not a good look. Right. And then the next night, fucking destroyed, destroyed. it. And it's like, an, and that's the one that you see. Live in the Sunset Strip, he had, like, a red suit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's iconic. It's, you always hear, I, I always hear about that, like, like, or, like, either way, if you bomb first and then go try to do a second show, sometimes it's better, or sometimes people, like, kill, and they're like, I want to go do another set somewhere. Mm, yeah. And then you bomb that one with, yep. like, the same shit. And I had the same little thing. I mean, I, again, everything that I'm experiencing in real time, it's like, you know, the Fisher Price version. It's mm. like, you know, the, it's like, I'm just getting started having, like, my firsts. Yeah, well, can and I so, tell you this? It's yeah. funny that you say that, because those first things, the, you always relearn those lessons the entire time over and over the stakes get higher yeah so like all these things you're probably still learning them Mm -hmm. but like you'll find that you get to a point and then it's almost like they start over it's like when you graduate high school and you're like a freshman in college or something and then you forget the bottom again you forget some of the more basic math yeah and then you're like oh yeah fuck i forgot i had already learned this but then it's it's higher stakes so it's like a little bit more complicated yeah and that just is a loop i mean i'm constantly like relearning like things that I know better, like, ugh, I'll get off and I'll be like, I'm so stupid. Like, how did I let that happen? Like, I just, yeah, it's like such a basic mistake and like, uh-huh. but you know, then I probably won't do that again for another year. Did you have like a problem where like, like something like that where you knew that you were, you kept making this mistake, but you somehow couldn't fix it. And then at some point it clicked for you and you were like, oh, you know, like, hmm. you know what I mean? Like something where you were constantly making the same uh, move over and over again that you knew like you got off stage and like I did it again and then for some reason yeah. you figured it out and now you know you don't the worst thing that I used again. to do was so the comedy store God bless that building because it really let me fail for a long time it supported my dreams when I had nothing to give back you mm-hmm. know how, like Tony says what can you bring to the mothership there was nothing I could bring to the comedy store that that place just gave me a place to learn I mean did not have to but it did and uh, I learned some tough lessons and over the span of a while, like a decade, and uh, one thing that I always fucked up for there was like a good like there's years where I would make this mistake, but they allowed they allowed me to like really like it was the first place I got to yell at adults and be like <laughs> fuck you and like be like you know like fight back like I was always like never that shit kid. you couldn't say to your parents right. or whatever right and so I would blame the audience more than I should have and mm. it would just so I'd get when I got past I got late spots for a long time like late and that means like 1 a.m. but the show at the comedy store it starts at 9 it goes all night there's not multiple shows it's one long show and the yeah. audience is just there for hours and the audience has seen all the greatest comedians, some of them are super famous, right. and then I'm on hours later. <laughs> so that's just a, so that's and, and awesome. the room, and it's not like the whole audience stays. It's it they leave, and it's like whoever's left, right? And some of them are people that are too drunk to leave. Some of them are waiting for their check. They're literally one foot out the door. Some of them are into it, and some of them are like asleep. You know, like hammered. Yeah, so. It's not not a good crowd. I mean, they probably were a great crowd two hours ago, but mm-hmm. not for me right now. Um, and I would get mad and be like, you know, I'd get mad that they were tired, and I would go off on them. And uh, and the talent coordinator at the time would would call me on it every now and then. He would call me on it, and it was just like you got to stop blaming the crowd. Well, dude. it's like and and then like, but. I also had to grow up because think about it. It's not their fault. These guys were great audience members. It's it's I'm the one that's here super late. Like I had to learn that whatever I'm faced with, that's that's the room I got. Yeah. Like whatever I could do with that, I there's no point in blaming them for anything. 100%. I'm here at the same time that they are. They happen to be here a lot longer than me. And part of connecting, right? We were talking about mm-hmm. the connection part is be, being able to empathize with their experience also. Yeah. This, where they are, this is where they are. Like, just because I'm coming in here stoked to go up and, like, but then mad that they ruined my spot because they're tired, it's like, that's not, 
I'm a showman. A showman is going to adapt to the audience. 100%. And, you know, it took a long time and learning how to get my anger in check and and, uh, and actually eliminate all anger up there. I mean, at least for me, some guys are really good at anger. Well, some guys, it makes them funnier. The whole usually, <laughs> Well, yeah, usually the rant comedians are, are better at yeah. that. And I just, what that's not in my range, you know? Yeah. So, like, I had to learn how to, like, not, like, you know, uh, roll with it basically right. and not try to fight with not fight the crowd like be on their side be with them yeah like actually roll with how tired they are like dude if you want to lay down <laughs> like literally like That's everybody funny. in this room could just lay down and it would actually probably look more full right. if we all just laid down right now and then people laugh at that yeah funny. yeah and remember because i was like good at bombing right so i already had that so, so like i started right your fuel you're getting your fire's getting fueled yeah right okay. and then that you know do a few minutes of making fun of how shitty this is um, now th I got them and you can go into material. Yep. Now. They trust nice. me. Yeah. A lot of times I'm I had a hard that. time following that with material. Yeah. Cause I would kill with the connection. And then I tried to go into a joke that was like, n had nothing to do with this moment that I was just making fun of. Yes. You know what I mean? Then I had to learn how to like tell jokes in a way that were like off the top and seem, you know, were like the Al Magical thing where it was like, it was conversationally was able to sneak this stuff in here. I like yeah. to call it blurring the lines. Mm-hmm. Of a is this is he just saying this now or is this a joke? Like I can't. That tell. is kind of the best. That's the I mean that's the right? sleight of hand of that yeah. what we do. That's the magic trick. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like a guy like Brian Simpson is so good at that. Brian Simpson will hit a joke at some angle, like you he he start talking about it and it it doesn't seem like it's gonna go where, like it's gonna go. Like he actually starts talking, like he'll start talking to them, and as he's going, he's nudging them. They they they're not conscious of it, but he's like. He's he's basically nudging you into a corner, and once he has you cornered, then he's gonna unload what his material is. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. It's a, it was just like, like uh, I don't know that guy. I bring him up because w when I was doing the late spots, after a while, I got really good at that. Like mm -hmm. that that the that kind of condition of a room, the tired, you know, drunken, wanting to go. Like after all the famous comedians, like because mind you, I'm also at the comedy store you know, when it started to succeed and then it became the biggest comedy club on the planet. So I saw both. I saw the dark ages and the exact opposite. Wow. And and so when it was when it was the bumping and it was like back to like this great business again, um, I, had, I had gotten really good at late night, but I was complacent in it. I just knew the same things to make fun of the same things. Right. You know, I kind of just it was almost autopilot in, in mm -hmm. a way. And then Brian Simpson got passed. And uh, I had to step it up. They put him in late night with me. And I was like, fuck. Because he was coming in with, like, new jokes. And I just thought, like, dude, I'm like, it was the thing. It was, like, inspired me to, like, get better and write better. And Would you have to follow him? Yeah. Or, okay. Or or he co comes up after and, like, I would do what I did. And he would come up after and destroy. And it was like, there was no excuse. You know what I yeah. mean? So, you know, like, we could all learn from each other. Yeah, absolutely, man. And it is, it is interesting to hear you talk about that because, you know, we kind of deal with a similar thing, but it's like I've been this whole time I've been basically trying to draw like similarities and differences between the music thing because I've been doing the touring and doing the music thing for like over 10 years toured with we just went on our biggest tour this last year with like a huge band took us out I don't know do you know metal metalcore bands and stuff like that or not really yeah born of Osiris took us out I don't know if you've heard of them but they're they're big in our little niche subgenre. sure big it was a big deal for me it's like my favorite band growing up took us on tour oh it's I like, hear holy you. Shit. I hear you know you, what bro. I mean it's kind of like when you've gone up with legends and shit that you grew up absolutely with, like totally looking up to and yeah shaping you and stuff and like so, I, I'm featuring for Harlan Williams this weekend and I oh could tell God. anybody that I could tell my dad that I could tell anybody that and odds are they're gonna be like you know cool. like that's cool he sounds yeah. cool you know yeah. but if I first of all if I were to tell high school Matt Edgar that like yeah. that's like insane to me right and if or, or any other comedian gets how cool that that's is. that's the dude he did the movie where he went to space right rocket man rocket man yeah, yeah. okay yeah Super but he's like so much he had a good little movie career. He was in Dumb and Dumber, had oh, an right. iconic scene in Dumb and Dumber. But to me, it's more of his stand up. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, he, uh, I don't think I've ever seen it. He's special, dude. Yeah. He's like a genius. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, I've always been a fan of the stand up that he does. Okay. And, um, and he, uh, yeah, it's like, it's like what you're saying. Like, I get to open up for this guy that, like, I yeah. can't believe, 
that I'm but, even going to be on the so same show. So we've played those bigger shows, and then there's like nights where we have to headline on, you know, we call them an eat, shit, and die tour, where you're just hitting markets and mm. just getting your name out there. Yeah. And like, you're lucky if the promoter and the locals sell tickets. Like, that's the only right. way. People there don't know who you are, so you're basically banking on the locals to bring people in right. so that you can be like, this is us. Yeah. You're gonna no, buy, I know, you're gonna buy shirts. And like, you have to put on, you when you see that you're about to go on and there's only three kids in there. Mm -hmm. Right, you have to go a hundred and fifty percent, and then those three kids will buy one of each of your shirts, and they'll never they're gonna go tell all your friends. So it's mm -hmm. like it's kind of the same. I feel like it's a similar thing to like working the late night rooms, where it's like you have to you have to learn how to get over that fucking this sucks. Yeah, this sucks. Nobody came out. We suck. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? How am I gonna fucking you know? There's another big show in the same town. Like mm -hmm. all the kids are there. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? And so it's like, and then but for me, it's like. I've had in like I said all my first this year with comedy right so it's like I had like a little five minute spot on an actual show like just a little mm -hmm. bar it was a bar show but it was ticketed and that was so much easier for me and better after like six months of doing a rough open mics I yeah. was like that was so much like they were so much nicer to me yeah right. they laughed at me you know what I mean and it was oh, yeah. like and it was like that was even a little bit more of a taste of like what I'm used to when I go on stage and do metal shit mm -hmm. everyone's fucking having a good time right you know what I mean it's not it's not just 10 angry musicians and like three drunk people you know what I mean like some of the mics can be like kind of rough you oh know what I mean like, well that's that's where it goes back to what I was saying about the way comedians practice is by doing it like right. there's no you know, if you're going to learn guitar, you're going to strum that alone in, at your place. Yes, yeah. Nobody's going to hear those first notes that you've ever hit, and it doesn't even sound right. Or That's it's the like, craziest difference, um, You actually have to go up there and do it in order to practice it. And that's yeah. why I always – stand-up is a practice. Like, any time you're watching a comedian, they're practicing. Yeah. Because it's not like we get to do this anywhere else. This is it. I, I, I have new jokes, and I've never said this stuff to anyone. So, like, this crowd's going to get it. For the first time, I'm gonna under. I mean, I don't even know how it's gonna go, but that's just kind of the beauty, and you know, sure. I live for that. At this point. <clears throat> and then like, you're, ner are you like nervous about that kind of stuff? The is, new jokes? Yeah. Is there a nervousness at this point, or you're kind of over that? You know what, you're dude? Excited? So like, one thing that changed everything for me. I think we stumble on, you know, you have um these breakthroughs, right? And uh, in certain things. In stand up, and I think everybody learns anything differently. But for me, connection was important, and I knew I had to calm my nerves. I knew I couldn't get yeah. anything done without how nervous I was. And uh, I remember thinking one time in the back of the original room at the comedy store, I think I was already a paid regular. So when you're a paid regular, the stakes were higher. Like I had to like be a pro, you know, and I mm -hmm. wasn't yet. And I remember um, the guy before me had the light. And I could just feel my heart racing. And it was up. bad. It was bad. It was racing bad. And I couldn't control it. Like, I was trying to, like, I was trying to breathe. And then, you know, he's got the lights. So I'm, like, two to three minutes away from getting up on stage. And uh, I don't know where the, where this came from, but I just thought about how, you know, I, I looked at the guy's microphone. I looked at him holding the mic. And, and I remember thinking, like, all I ever – all I – all day, all day long, all I've wanted to do was grab that mic. Actually, that's all I ever want to do. As a matter of fact, I'm sad and mad when I don't get to. And now is my turn to grab that mic. What am I nervous about? This is exactly what I wanted. You've been thinking all day about that. That's all I think about ever. Yeah. And why am I nervous? And then the nerves, that just turned into excitement. And this thing, it switched. So then I thought, Nervous energy is energy. Um, you could you could you could manipulate that energy and turn that nervousness into excitement, which is also energy. Excitement is energy. Right. So it was almost like, it's like a I had to rewire is a perspective. I had yeah. to rewire what nervousness was mm. and turn that into excitement. So now take I'm, it from the negative to a positive. Basically. I'm just excited. Yeah. Like I'm never that nervous. I'm I'm excited. If I'm nervous, that's because I fucked up and like got high or, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, like. But yeah. even then, it's like I nothing bad. I, I just my brain is so used to this that yeah. I don't I'm only excited. I don't think. Uh, yeah, I'm just not nervous. Just I'm even, equals excited for you. now. Yeah. 
after that person. When was that? How long ago did you make that God, perspective I mean, that, switch? Ten at, years probably ago? Probably after ten. I mean, probably after being in comedy for ten years. Yeah. Yeah. But then it just became so routine that you just don't. I don't. I don't think about it. And then, um, you know, it's it's just these are all mental games that we play mm-hmm. with ourselves. Like you, you just got to learn how to use your brain the way that that it works best. Oh, what I was gonna say was that the like so when I play like big shows, don't phase me. Mm-hmm. And and like when I play those little like like for metal for music, and then when I play those little shows, I'm able to go. All right, this is just a practice. Like we're like you were saying, this is just we're just gonna go as hard as we usually go. If there was 500 people in here, even though there's just three, but for me, like with stand up what i'm finding right now is like that nervousness and i do need to sit with myself and do i guess a perspective change on mm-hmm. that cuz i feel the same way mm-hmm. and but it's like i'm more nervous in front of three people and a couple comics at an open mic for some reason right now than i am in at, you know with with a little crowd of people yeah like i feel like that's more like my i'm like oh yes this kind of reminds me of like what i'm used to with music and then so it's like i'm really trying to find my comfort which i feel like i'm getting closer every time i go up but mm-hmm. it's like i'm trying to find the comfort with with you know less people and just kind of being comfortable almost being up there alone yeah like it's kind of how, well, what, if I were that's to give, what i'm going through right if, now if i were to give any like young comedian advice on that i'd, I'd say Get as many cold open spots as you can. Most people don't want to do them. There's plenty of people that would, you know, would love to have some kid bite the bullet and then the host goes on. Yeah. The, when you learn to cold open, you know, that's like you're starting the show. Mm-hmm. That takes a level of command. Yeah. But you have to command the audience to, to get them going. And it's not easy. And some of them aren't even ready for it. And they've never even seen a comedy show ever. They don't even know how to act or feel. And you're the first comedian they'll ever see. And, you, you know, like, if you could start a show and get it going, I mean, you need to learn how to command. And nothing, you'll never get more confident than when you know at any point, like, if there was a, a comedy, sh- if there was a room next door and there's an audience and the show hasn't started yet, right now, I don't need anybody to get on the God mic and guys, ladies, and are you ready? Right. I will walk up on that stage and take the mic and go. And pump it up. Yeah. Nice. Like, they're going to know as soon as I step up there that it's on. This right. is it. Let's go. Yeah. And that, if every comedian needs to learn that, that is like okay. the hardest thing to do. And if you could just get through that and do that, everything else is going to be easier. Because nice. any kind of spot where somebody was on before you, like that's the easiest, like that's going to seem so easy because they're already used to the show. Yeah. Starting it. There's this guy, Ron G. Shout out. Really funny dude out of LA. Um, he used to host this show. There's a show called Crack 'Em Up Thursdays at the Comedy Store in the Belly Room. It's like an, the oldest show at the Comedy Store, the longest lasting show at the Comedy Store. It's a black show. And he would host. But at the time, uh, on those Thursdays, I would be the, I'd park cars that night. So he would have me go up first. I would cold open a black show and I had no skill or confidence. <laughs> and I would just go get my ass beat every week. And he was <laughs> never, there was never a problem. He was so cool, man. He always knew that. He wanted the white dude to go get beat up real quick. I mean, think about it, though. It's kind of fun. But think about it, though. Like, this is a black show. The first thing you're going to see is this skinny white boy that's not good. Yeah. And he's going to go up. If anything, it almost made it harder for him because now he's got to clean this shit up. But he was so skilled. Like, because the energy in the room was fucked up? Well, it was just like there was. It was the show wasn't started. He was just doing it to teach me. There's no other reason why this guy should do that. other than he's just a cool motherfucker that you know liked me for whatever he's as a yeah. guy just like this this, this kid's cool i'll, I'll help him mm-hmm. and i kind of in a lot of ways learned how to start a show in the worst conditions i mean black audiences what what's so great about a black audience is how fair they are i mean they are fair dude if if first of all if they smell the fear you're done Damn. Don't be scared, and that's that's true, man. We're showmen. We shouldn't yeah. be scared up there. Like no. we're 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 ca- we're the captains of the ship. Like we're running this thing, or we're so, trying to be. Well, you better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're not fucking around, dude. They're not right. giving. They're not giving you any like extra leeway. You no. know what I mean, that's a good. That's a good audience. They're not gonna so. laugh to be nice. No. Yeah. But that's a good audience. I'd yeah. rather have that every night than an audience that's just giving it up because they they're worried. They're happy that, to be there, or whatever, or just whatever. that they're that they're like scared that I'm not gonna that it's gonna hurt my feelings or something. Right. That's that's not helpful. Yeah. Um, but you know, and this is the crazy part about how, like, the career a career in comedy is. This guy Ron G. He books a bunch of stuff, way bigger comedian than me back then and now. 
However, just I think it was like just this year or this last year, he finally got passed at the store. Something that I got, you know, o- over 10 years ago. Like the career is so fucked up because like this guy should have been passed back then. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but it took him a decade later. Just happens at different times. Yeah. For people. That's why like this is why another thing that I love about this scene is it doesn't seem like people are so are too eager. I mean, I know they want it. You know what I mean? Everybody wants especially the mothership. Everybody wants to be in the mothership. And uh, I get that. And I and I mean, I really get that because I had a home club that was very supportive. But, you know, like, what is the real goal here? Is it to get in at the clubs or it's is to it to get, become great? It's to get better. It's to become great. Yeah. You want to be great at something. And you could do that anywhere. Because even like a Ron G was great without the comedy store. Now mm-hmm. he gets, you know, just now he gets to fucking now basically. Now his stage time's better. Right? Yeah. yeah. He's way better than he was then, even right. though he was ready then. You know what I mean? And that's just like, um, that's just like a that's like a cool attitude that not only is not only do, did I want to bring to this scene, but it's like also kind of already here. Well, yeah, and it's just like shit takes time. Like I've been talking about this a lot on the podcast with other uh, other guests, but it's like with the music thing, like we just got our first big break this year mm-hmm. with that band taking us on tour. That took eleven years. Mm-hmm. So it's like I have a very I feel like realistic. Like if I if I work at this for ten years, then maybe I'll maybe I'll be good or better by mm. by the time I'm forty. Yeah. You know what I mean? And no I know doubt. I'm starting late. I wish I would have started when I was you know seventeen years ago or whatever. But it's like you start when you start, and mm. you know there's legends like Joey Diaz fucking started when he was in his fifties, oh, right? bro, or something like I that. Mean, so it's I, like I'm not gonna throw some of my mentors under the bus, but I know guys that started like yeah, like forties, fifties, and they're famous now. And not only are they famous, they're great at stand up. So it's like, yeah, do we all learn these things? Uh, most of it is like is knowing thyself, which that just takes time and right. age does that. You don't really an experience, obviously. But like for me, like I had to find myself within the 17 years, whereas like some of these older guys that start, they know who they are. So they come in, they're way more comfortable in their own skin. Yeah, that's a huge edge. Yeah, that's how I mean, we are we're all just trying to get comfortable up there. It's like a lot of guys want to they they move here. I see it, you know, with people I've talked to and 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 different open micers and stuff. It's like you see people come here, they move here, they want to they they sign up for Kill Tony every week even if they don't have material ready. It's like they they want to get on Kill Tony, they want to get famous. Yeah. And it's like, dude, like it's going to take years. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? It's kind of a crazy thing that the the culture of the way that Kill Tony's changed the culture because there are guys that like could start off. You know, I went to one of the arena shows, mm-hmm. the New Year's there. Eve show. You yeah. went to that. Um, you know, most of the people that he drew out the bucket that night, that was their first time ever doing stand up. Could you imagine the first time you do stand up is in a eight thousand person arena? Yeah, that's crazy. It was nuts. I signed some of those people up. I was helping. I was helping. Oh, you're working some. there. Yeah, we saw some of the people like 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 the first girl that went up. I we she came up to our like sign up table, and we were all just kind of like when when she went up, we were I was like no, yeah, because she was like, you know just signing up for the fun of it. But hey, that's part of the show. Yeah, you know what well, I, mean? I think it's, it's also how the show works. It's still it's still like uh, fair. Like um, I love that dude Heath. Oh yeah, and like Heath the. Uh, was telling me how he was in Houston. I think he said he was from Houston, and and he started. Nothing was happening. They didn't give a. Nobody gave a fuck. He does kill Tony, pops off that, and now he could actually, if he wanted to, he could go headline. No doubt, he could definitely sell tickets and go mm-hmm. out on the road. But he gets it in that like he doesn't feel like he's ready to headline. He just wants to do spots. He wants to be great first before. Yeah, he and so, but what's great about his the position he's in, people would totally give him spots. Right. You know, he may not be making the headliner money without, you know, if he's not headlining, mm-hmm. but he's getting, like, legit practice. And in only a few years, he could probably go out there and start. It's kind of a weird thing, isn't it, where, like, because, again, I'm learning all this stuff on the fly, but it's, like, like, the stage time it's like you have to unlock better stage time to get past a certain point of skill right like mm-hmm. you can't just you can't become a pro at open mics right or can you like could no. you could you you know what i mean like you have to go up in front of real audiences at some point so oh, yeah. it's like a, it's almost like a chicken and egg thing like you have to trudge through the open mics to unlock this your this ability and then once you get past a certain point you can start getting spots on shows you know like 
this year I feel like I'm a, like my I have very simple goals for the for the year. Like I want to get ten to fifteen minutes dialed in and and do a couple more spots mm -hmm. and uh, you know and a couple less mics. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's you know I don't think that's crazy, to, you know, to try to to try to work on that. But it's like it's it, a lot of people are like in their first year and they're like I want to fucking headline. I want to be. It's like dude. It's yeah, like, it's gonna take some time, brother. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's like you, you talking to you talk look listen to the greats talk. People like you that have been in the game for a long time, and it's like, you know, Matt Edgar didn't just fucking do stand up for a year and then pay, get passed at the at the store. You know, it's like it takes a long fucking time. Yeah, I I think for me, um, the thing I had going for me what or that I do have going for me isn't I never got a following yet you know i never really put any effort into that i don't put any effort into mm -hmm. i literally just practice the craft and see where that goes and where it's taken me is i really do have an easy time accessing the the, the major comedy clubs yeah i don't know well you have the respect of your peers i have know, the respect of my peers but i know that you're a but i also i mean at this point it's like i i believe that i should be passed at all of them if i just showed up and they saw me i don't i don't think if if somebody now like I didn't go. I've never been to the. I never performed at the cellar. I, I don't. Yeah. You know. Like I. I've never tried to get in there. But say I go to the cellar, and they say no, he's not good. To me, it's like you're just wrong. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. I mean, whatever, dude. Like you're you. Like, like I've been doing this for a and, long time. And what if I didn't do good for if for some reason I didn't do good? I still think they're wrong. It's like oh, is I didn't do good that time. You know what I yeah. mean? And um, but if it was if it was uh. If it was based off merit and merit alone, yeah, I would. I have no doubt that I could get into any of the clubs. Yeah. So, but I don't. I don't think that. Do. I mean, we all approach the business side of it differently, and I'm not saying I do it the the, the best way. Obviously not. But to me, um, what matters the most is really that I'm just killing every as much as possible, and yeah. and and, and I'm writing new shit all the time, and. What that gives me is more than what just being at at like a uh, – because take it from a guy who got passed at, at the biggest comedy club that there is very, very early on and uh, didn't really – it didn't bump my career up. It didn't bump my numbers up. It didn't, didn't give, you give me more dollars, money yeah. or fame. It, it was uh, – it actually – it just gave me practice. I mean it's all about practice. Yeah. And that's – I mean to me, just keep it simple. Just write. It's all about the next joke. It, mm. Every time you write a new joke, you get better, because you're doing something you haven't done, and then you're gonna push yourself, and and you're and you're gonna get more confident, and that's just more time you have on like more minutes to to add to your like you said 15 minutes, dude. If you if you're trying to get 15 minutes by the end of the year, and you write a uh, a one minute joke, you know like how much clo you're like closer. Now you only got to get like uh, 13 minutes right. for the whole year. Like that's like, and then do it again. Keep and doing it. Over keep and over doing again. it, and next thing you know, like you have that time. You know, I went up with some new stuff, like I said on Wednesday, and it like did good. And then I went last night and tried the same stuff, didn't do good. Well, you, you also, know what I mean. And so you got to just keep. It's, you're at the point where you just got to be throwing all the new stuff up there as much as possible. Right. And if you have anything that works, d definitely do that. I mean, for me, like I, I, I would say I wrote my first good joke seven years into stand up. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so yeah. I got some time. Yep. And all I right. think in that same summer, I wrote. Two good jokes. So I had an opener and a closer, but nice. the middle, just like pr just like figuring it out, yeah. just trying to like maybe this worked. Don't know. Okay. Da -da -da, you know. I always feel better about the stuff that I feel like works. You know, who? What do I know? But it's like it, it, the stuff that I feel like I have. Maybe it does. It doesn't. It, whether it works or not, we haven't figured that out yet. But it's like the stuff that I have down. Like yeah. I know how I want right. to say it. Right. Because this first whole year has been like, how do I say shit? The shit I want to say. How do right. I? How do I even do this? You, you know what I mean? Yeah, and so yeah. it's like the it's like training. You mean wheels. like inflection? Maybe yeah. Just act out. Mm -hmm. Just like just like what do I want? to Good to think about that stuff. How do I? How do I? How do I put? How do I get this off of paper? It's good and get to it in think that, and it's good to wonder that. But you have to know that you just trust that you're you're gonna figure that out. Yeah. Like it, that just comes from practice. But it's good that you're on. Like like I like for me the connecting thing. Like mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily. I had some already connective ability that was that God gave me, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have. It wasn't like enough to like you know finish the job. Or do like to really make that good, yeah. but um, but you know I knew it was important. So I in the back of my mind I always considered that, and like, um, and there's just so much nuance into this that like you the more you go through it and you keep those are the good questions you got to ask those questions, but like, 
you also have to trust that you're going to get those answers. So don't like just take the material up there and just just roll, know that just roll with it. Just know that these are the things I need to figure out, but I will figure them out. Mm -hmm. The more I do this, I get closer to figuring them out. And that's all you that's really all you could do. There's no easy way. And even a guy like um like Heath, like, you know, he's a kid. He's 21. That's when I started. He could already headline. You know what I mean? Like it's he crazy. could already do things that I can't just necessarily based off do. of like following and popularity alone. Right. right. But, you know, either way, he's still going to have to learn all of this. Everybody, everybody that you have to go. Through you the still same have groups. to go through the same because no matter what, you're going to be taken to deep waters. Then what? Right. I've had to tour with bands. I've opened. That was a whole part of my career was on the road with bands. And I watched them go through like I'm opening shows that they don't Doing even know comedy? that there's yeah yeah and they won't even some of these audiences didn't even know that there's a comedian and it was and they're all standing there you yeah. know and i watched them go through like the things you're saying where like the first time i ever came to austin was with a band what and band? there's this band uh out of nashville called the vegabonds they're super good southern I rock think i've heard of them before. Yeah. yeah and they um i got put together with them through this tour this adam carolla tour it's just a whole thing but anyways we I get to know them and I'm on the road with them and uh you know I watch what it was like to be in they it w w we met at the right time like these four dudes wait five dudes we met at the right time because I was a comedian for as long as they were a band and they were at the point where they had they had their runs like they knew where to go where they would have an audience but there was places like they had never really been in Texas or I think that mm -hmm. was like yeah they hadn't been this far west at the time and, and it was a Texas tour so we meet them out here I never knew these guys I meet them in San Antonio and there's barely anybody there you know what I mean and it's like in a lot of those shows there's barely anyone there yeah. um and I watched them go through that but like uh it was funny because the tour at first was like I think it was like either two weeks or something like that Texas to Arizona to Vegas to San Diego and and then it ended in San Diego and then they come to LA and they do a show and then I'm back home and I think it was like I'm off the road for a few hours and one of them texts me hey man you want to come back to Nashville we got all these shows on the way back it's just our Christmas run it's like the same shows they're going to be awesome and I had nothing going on at the time and so I was like I've, I already miss these dudes like yeah. I really Dude, just the tour brotherhood is oh, so the real the brother I the mean these guys crazy. are my brothers and I don't really get to hang out with them because they're in Nashville and then they're doing their thing I'm doing my thing but it's like there's a there's a bond you yeah. know what I mean and uh so I went with them and and I got to watch the whole other side of their thing where like these they go into the towns that they sell out in it was night and day wow. now these guys are like rock stars yeah. I mean now now they're like huge the room the rooms are bigger and bigger right and you know but uh no it's an interesting thing watching like what certain people like they're one of those bands that had to grind it out over decades and then some people just have a hit mm -hmm. you know what i mean and it just seems like they it's like way easier for them but they all had to learn how to play really good and this band is they're so good each member of the vagabonds is great at their instrument yeah you know and so like but that only could come from you know these decades of just doing these shitty rooms That's all the time what we've and, been doing, and yeah. you do it for the love of the game yeah exactly like it wasn't paying off and like like when we finally we did that for you know 10 years doing little little runs and then like right before we got the big tour last year we we did like two full u.s runs that were kind of shitty you know yeah, what i mean yeah, and then and then we went out with this big band and every show was like 500 to a thousand people wow. packed and they were going crazy we went to canada and those people are fucking awesome oh, yeah. and they Canada's buy merch and we were making all this mer merch money and like you know we were going through it still like the van kept breaking down yep. so all the money we made for merch we had to put into the van mm -hmm. and they're like so we were still lear learning you know shit that we crashed i cr i crashed the van in the snow oh yeah in canada and we like we almost died it was crazy yeah. and like i told the the born of osiris dudes like we're gonna be there we crashed the van and they're like oh yeah been there yeah like, like They've been they've everything that we were gonna go through they've had to learn at some oh, point. Oh yeah, kind of like what you were saying about comedy too, but it was like it's it is totally I, I get what you're saying because those shitty tours where we played in front of three people in Orlando two two t two tours in a row, mm -hmm. like it primed us because we destroyed every oh, yeah. single night. Oh, and, I mean th that was the thing too. I mean. The practice in front of people, it, it, even if it's not that many people, it's all practice. You get, need practice. Yeah. Um, 
I, I could be butchering this story, but like the Vagabonds came out for like um, their record labels in, in L.A. And I think like they wanted to make like this, the label wanted to make a Christmas track or something with uh, a bunch of their musicians. Mm -hmm. And some of these guys, like the other musicians were pretty young, you know, and like they the Vagabonds were probably the old guys at the party. And they're not even that old, but they were, had been around for longer. And everybody's doing their part and it's taken like hours just to get their part in and the vagabonds roll through there's two of them. they just brought two of them the drummer and the bass so the, the rhythm section shows up and they just knock their shit out all right guys. and everybody's Please. like like they just taught a lesson in yeah. music you know what i mean and these guys definitely have been grinding way harder than anybody else here that right they is, got that label ticket basically yeah like, like the 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 new guys i got the label ticket but the Vagabonds dudes have been grinding for years. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they're okay. better musicians, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, all every every member, their, their guitar player is this guy, Richard, and he, Richard Forehand. He's like a fucking, um, just shreds, dude. I just could watch this guy. And he's like obsessed with guitar. Like, he, like, I caught him out one night. He's on YouTube and he's just like watching guitar building, like somebody's like building a guitar. Oh, yeah. And then he talks to his, his dad's the same way. And he, his dad, sh they're sh showing each other videos of this. Look at this fucking. It's like just weird Look at guitar the fretboard. Yeah, that. right. Yeah. Like weird the intonation. Like what a dork. You yeah, know what I mean? like, yeah, dude. Yeah, but hey, whatever, whatever. Fucking, you know, revs your engine for for whatever. Well, you're that's into. why it's like all you have this, to be obsessed with shit. Yeah, and to the point where you don't, you'll do it even if it's not working out. Yeah, like you can't. Like I'll be a stand-up comedian till I die. But money or not, fame, not success, not like yeah. that's just what that's what I, I'm. That, I have a blood oath to this art form. It's, it's never awesome. gonna not be like yeah. I will literally die a comedian. That's how I feel about music too, and 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 stand up. I mean, I'm just getting into it, but I feel like I've gotten enough of the fucking you know those little those little like hits that, that make you kind of an addict for it. I'm yeah, like, I still it's like you know, and some some nights you're like, all right, we're gonna go, we're gonna go get it. Sometimes I'm like, I don't feel funny, you know, or like I don't feel like I could, you know, and then like the mics, maybe the last week sucked, I fucking ate shit, and then it's like, all right, well, I gotta go fix that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like fixing it and making it better, it's like you get fucking addicted to that shit. Yep. And that's kind of where, where I'm at right now. Well, it's, it's like, like when you write a joke and you know that there's like something's got to change. There's some and meat, and there, you're like, there's something here that's, yeah. that I know is funny. It's funny to me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? How do I fucking convey that? How close? I mean, because it feels close. So it's like, what? Is it like a word or is it the way or can I use a different example or yeah. you know what I mean? That's just, that's How do fun you thing. physically write shit down? Because I feel like everyone's got... Mm -hmm. Everyone has their own little method, you yeah. know, and it's like for me, I have all the ideas I think of that are funny are in my notes mm -hmm. and I'm like, it's like, the, it's such a long note now. Yeah. And there's shit. I'll scroll way back and I'm like, oh, fuck, dude. Yeah. Like, let's try well, it's that. Good to keep, I and, think it's good to keep a notebook on you with yeah. a pen just because there's something about been. writing it on the paper that commits it to memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been know? doing that. Like when I go to the mics, I'll like write down what I'm going to say, yeah. like little bullet notes about what I want to say. Yeah. I think I, I literally think, and, and I mean, put it on your phone. I guess that works too, but there's something I, I feel like it really solidifies it when I write it. And, um, but, but, uh, like to answer your question like to write like my my thing is i usually there's wells that i pull from like different emotions that i pull from that i'm like it just are more in my range so like something that i'm really i i find like i guess the funny in or like where i'm funniest in is when it comes to like insecurity like something i'm insecure about if i could and this is where getting this is where this is your job this is like this is where it becomes your job is that when you find that thing that like you just could pull from this endless well of like for me it's like insecurity rather than it's like I'll, I'll something will come up I'll feel the insecurity and then I got to remember the comedian has to activate and take a step out of it mm -hmm. and look at it you know three dimensionally not in it just look at it and then re and immediately I could see what's funny about it just because it's like that insecurity is so dumb. And it's also like relatable, like no doubt. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, like uh, I have this joke. Um, John Mayer followed my girlfriend, followed her on Instagram, mm -hmm. and then I was just like, 
you know, she, she was in a movie and then she's blowing up. And I was like, is fucking John Mayer the guy I have? She says not to worry about. <laughs> yeah, you know what exactly. I mean? Like, because if it is, you're fucked. I'm fucked. I'm yeah, just like, this guy could have her. Like, I'm not even going to fight this guy. Yeah. You know, like, you're like, you would be happy. No, I get to it. Give her no, it's John like, Mayer. dude, I like YOLO. Yeah, yeah. Like, yo, like, um, but that, the first feeling was, Am I gonna? Am I the guy? Yeah. That, Do I have to worry about fucking John, John Mayer? Mayer? That's just, sliding into my girlfriend's Like, of DMs? course I have to worry about John Mayer. Right. And then, but that's a real feeling. And mm -hmm. then, but you just take a second away from him. Like that is the comedy gods blessed you. With, that's ridiculous. With, yeah, it's hilarious. It's like that's and and then then it's just a joke. Then it's on me to like, you know. It, then it's on me to follow the fun. I always say that like, w w if you're trying to be funny, you're spinning your wheels. Funny is relative. Good luck trying to think what they think is funny. M maybe a little bit, but like you're not going to get it right all the time. I mean, the, the your odds are better if you if you find out what's fun to say about the thing. Like this John Mayer thing. What was fun to me wasn't. I couldn't write a joke like because then I was trying to like write jokes that based off his songs and try to reference songs and stuff sure. and think what they would get. But when it when I really was able to like what's fun, it was just like like, uh, you know, John Mayer followed my gr my girlfriend on Instagram. And it was like I'm like, dude, stay in your fucking lane, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. saying it the way that I want. That was fun. That was more fun to say than try to reference like a, a song from Gravity. Yeah. Or something yeah. Like yeah, that, yeah. You know, like. Uh, which all that stuff came out eventually once I started saying it. Then I saw a part where like, oh, that's where I could put in, you know, the a reference. Her body to, is a wonderland. Yeah, or yeah like I do that, actually. Right? Like her body's my wonderland. Right. Yeah. Step off, dude. I couldn't start there. It had to start with the, where what was most fun to say, and that Stay unlocked every. Lane. Yeah, that's just to me. Because that's off the, the some shit you would never say to John. Right. Mayer, right? Like, dude. Like, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that just was from there. That was the fun thing, and it unlocked everything else. And then it okay. became a full fledged joke. And then when I got stuck, I would just try to fall back back up, follow the fun some more. Okay. What's fun is that's gonna, that's the promised land. That's going to be funny. Fun. If you're a funny guy, whatever the fun thing to say will be funny. I promise. Yeah. Like, and you got to stop thinking about um, the specific people who will laugh. Like I have jokes about emo music because mm -hmm. emo is, I love the genre, mm -hmm. but in a lot of ways we got to talk about if, this too. In a lot of ways, it's codependent, pathetic music. Well, yeah, it's, and like, it's high school angst, and if you're listening it in, into your thirties, <laughs> you need to grow up. You're chasing like, the dragon, dude. Well, it's like you need to like get over her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's not coming back. Yeah. Like get a job, dude. Yeah. Stop hanging out in front of her parents' house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Stop running into the rain, you know, like. <laughs> um, but you know, when I first started talking about emo, because to me it's like a vulnerable type of genre, you know, and it's kind of like a guilty pleasure thing. I love how niche that is, too, not to throw you off what you're yeah. saying real quick, but it's like you're almost like – you're you're talking about what you can bring to the mothership. Yeah. To me, when I saw you live for the first time, uh, at, I think it was in the little room. It was like, oh my god, this dude is like for me. Yeah. Like, he's like for my demographic, yeah. my general right, but, age range, and the shit that we went through. It's like there's not a lot of comics that can kind of nail like this. Mm -hmm. Like not a lot of comics are talking about emo shit. Right. But it's, and it, it's, but it never. I never tried to do that. Right. Like if I were to, there's you could not try. I'm gonna get all these emo guys. Like right. There, or people who know this. Okay. There's none of that. It was the jokes were funny to me. Yes. You know what I mean? Like and it and it was it was almost like an accident stumbling on that whole thing because it came. It was like I was in the. I was at the comedy store and I said something like I referenced an emo band and I saw the it got the whole room did not laugh but the few people that did were really dying. laughed yeah. and I was like ooh you hit like a My Chemical ooh, Romance reference something. or something yeah I probably did a actually. Black Parade reference yeah, or something I, I and people did. were like I actually oh, did shit. the first time I ever posted on TikTok uh, was a joke it was about uh, uh, I was in a park I was doing comedy in a park and somebody <laughs> had filmed it and uh I had said something about how like this time I snuck into Warp Tour the way I got in I I got there the night before and slept in my car and when I woke up I was backstage. Oh, because they built it like they built it you? around me, <laughs> Trojan awesome. horse style. Nice. So I come out and then the, the dude from My Chemical Romance was there and I'm like, oh man, can I get some passes? And he's like, you're here. Yeah. What are you talking and, about? Yeah. And, was, and like this joke. You know, I think maybe I, that was the joke because I told it, it. It wasn't even a joke. I never wrote it. I just told the story one time, and um, it went really well on TikTok. 
And then I think I tried to retell it or something like that. And I just noticed, like, the whole room did not laugh, but the people who did uh, really did. And so then I was like, I should make, like, there's emo comedy night. Or, I mean, there's emo night. Like, I'm going to create emo comedy night. Emo night's so popular. That it's like a right. DJ playing emo music. Oh, yeah. It's become ironic again. So I'm like, I'm going to create emo comedy night where it's like I just go up and roast emo and bring up comedians that came up on it and like yes. they could talk about whatever they want they could do their own act but just know that everybody in this room if you want to reference this stuff they're gonna get it and uh you know maybe lean into like s jokes about getting dumped or something mm -hmm. and um so I had a whole room of people that were emo fans so all the jokes just landed I mean That's harder awesome. it's like imagine that few people that I had laughing in the original room if the whole room was just that um, and but then it kind of went beyond that because then I had these jokes down and I was like fuck it I'm just gonna I love those jokes. I want to keep telling them and mm. I started telling them in regular You know my comedy store spots and they were working and it worked out that totally e emo night became such a big fucking thing Right Na yeah nationally and there's so many and I was people. worried about doing it here because I thought they're not gonna like emo in Texas Oh, no, it, oh dude, yeah. and it's just like it kills Crushes. so hard it over crushes. there and I, I'm like this is like, this isn't because I tried to do that. I really was just talking about the things that I thought were funny and that I love. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, now there's now there's all these kids that like, you know, they'll DM me or they, or, or and also uh, the bands, like people in these emo bands yeah. follow me and they, you know, and it's like, it's, it's insane to me that like, just talking about the thing has actually attracted the thing. That you, but like you were saying like you've been saying it's like how if you would have tried to get that yeah it no wouldn't trying. have worked out that never way. no it has to be this organic like it comes back it around. was for me yeah and it's not that because i really do believe that we do it like we do this to give this is what this the stand-up comedy is the best i could give to society we all have to pitch into society like we all just have to you have to you can't be a piece of shit and just take mm -hmm. you can but nobody's gonna like you like you have to give back to this world. Yeah. And the best thing I could do is stand up. That's the only skill I could bring to the table. You're it's not a welder. Thing. Nope. And I can't <laughs> I can't do literally anything else. But uh so I give it all back that way, but then I, within the art of stand up, I know that the only way to make it work is by talking about the things that you think are funny. There's no predicting what other people think are, is funny. So like if you really got to take that deep dive and take the risks, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I had to take, you know, like, I think I even, in the in the showcase for the booker at Mothership, I might have done the emo jokes, which I don't, I don't think I'd told, no, I, there's no way I would have told them there yet. And not, not these guys may not know what I'm talking about. Right. It's so niche. But, um, but then I found out that they totally do, and that just motivated me to write more about it. Oh, yeah. I, I could keep thinking of this stuff, because it's fun for me, it's funny to me. Well, there's kind of countless like references and shit you can make with the emo shit. You know oh, what I dude. mean? Like all the different bands and all the different songs and how they're all pretty similar. You know what I mean? I was just at a nar that Narbar place the other day and that's like all they play there. Is that kind oh, of no shit. It's like almost like emo night every night. Kind really? Of. Yeah, but there's like two drunk girls that go there all the time and they're sitting there with the bartenders just like s singing Paramore. Like, oh yeah. my God, I'll they marry both of them. Yeah. <laughs> Where's this place? It's it's like across the street from Mothership. It's on six Narbar. Narbar. They I have like a bunch of skateboards on the wall. They do a mic there on. Do they do do bands play there? I maybe there's a stage because so I live I live. You said yeah. So oh, I they do? so okay. I live right there. Like I live in this building that's like overlooks like Mothership and all of Sixth Street, and I could hear music. Flex, dude. And I okay. hear I hear emo music up there. <laughs> I swear to God, is that Jimmy Eat World? Like, I, or, like no, it is, dude. That totally is. Or yeah. Fall Out Boy. Is that Blink. Chevelle? Yeah, I just like, I'm going down now. Yeah, I'm going to hang yeah, out with these guys. Yeah. But I haven't been there yet, so I got to right. do that. Maybe we'll go. I don't know. I'd love to. Yeah, let's do it. And and Vulcan has emo night. Yeah, so we were hanging out at one of those. I wanted to bring this up because we were we were having a ball, like just kind of like people watching yeah, at that, that was emo great. night. That was fun. Because, and, and I wanted, I mean, this is probably more your, more your flavor. Maybe you should just take, write the bit if you haven't already but just like the dudes 
at emo night that don't belong there yeah. that are just hunting for goth, I love goth pussy. You made that observation. I remember th- kind of being jealous because that's so funny because yeah. there's so many guys here that are well, you'll, you'll they're do treating more, you'll this do like more with it than I will. They would go it. into any club and act yeah, this way. Yes, yeah, and it's like a dude with like a backwards Yankee hat and he just doesn't look you know, in a fresh white tee and like mm. a gold cross Yeah, and he's just scouting for goth pussy. Right. Beep, 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 beep. You what know he what doesn't I mean? know is he's barking up the wrong tree. Right. That's like not what we do here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we we don't get pussy. No, dude. that's the whole point. Yeah, is that yeah, none of us are getting good, laid. That's good, actually. Yeah, that's so. You funny. take that energy, fucking. And f- it's funny. It's like, is my, you know, is my, I don't know, is my child, is my childhood angst just a hunting ground for pussy for you? So, is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, right. For these guys? Yeah, you, you know what I mean. Is, that's that's what this is to you. Yeah, yeah. This exactly. is fucking serious, and bro. It, my favorite was them trying to mouth the words off off key yeah, and right. as they're as they're prowling like lions in the Serengeti right. or something. They gotta you know act I mean? like they know. Yeah, it's shit. like I chimed in, and they're like. They're like all off. Yeah, they're yeah. like all off and just yeah, like they got to they got to that's the and best they just they look like they walked out of a lids. <laughs> right, you know no. what I mean? Like they don't they don't look any they don't look like they even used to and now they dress normal. Mm-hmm. Like they they just they look like they're just from a completely different universe no, than this. No, it's just about getting laid to those It's guys. just about and that's a whole I mean that's fish nets and mm-hmm. and leather skirts for them. Oh yeah, you they see I mean? the they see the emo girls and they're like, "Oh, these girls are definitely down to fuck." And I'm oh, like, and then they see the competition and they're like, "Oh, I can beat up pussy. all these guys." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Well, there it is, dude. There's the bit. Yeah. Yeah. That, no, that's funny. Uh, but yeah, we it was just, and we were also talking about like the playlist needs to be reined in a little. Oh yeah, bit, right? right. It's getting well, a little out there, right? As to what we're calling emo, and it's right. like, guys, it, there's enough songs in the act in the emo database. Uh-huh. We don't have to dip into Miley. No, I, that's what I was just gonna yeah, say. We like, have, yeah, I that's think not, you were in there. You're with you're, me you're missing like, out. I mean, where's the saves the day? Right. There's fucking yeah. get up kids. There's like way more. But where's Finch, dude? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Miley Cyrus. What it is, is to burn, dude? Yeah, where yeah. is Finch, dude? And they that's don't... a good. That's a good point, though. Yeah. No, right. I mean, there's all this emo stuff that they know. That's why. That's my problem with it. But like, you know, it's still fun. I just like that they're even having anything like that. Yeah. You know, like I. It's so. It's. It's just. It's. The... It's a great time to be alive. <laughs> it's a great time to be a millennial. Yeah. You know, the look you had on your face in there was just like. Yeah, like I did this. Yeah, I had a part in this. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. No like there was a look of proud, like a proud parent when you oh, go yeah. into an emo night. Well, it's funny because Nick, the owner, is always, you know, he knows how much I I, I fuck with that shit. So mm-hmm. he'll all, he'll start DMing me the posters before they even come out. Like yeah. to, to, like you you know put this on your calendar. It's happening. Yeah. So like you know when we when we go, I'm usually like been I've known about this for a while. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And actually like. You know, it's what that's what's great about living right there is that I know that I could even book spots and like kind of work around it. Like yeah. every time you I've only been in there, in. pop in and then come back. Mm-hmm. Like I do that all the time. Like I'll come in, like get motivated, go do my spot, leave, and then just come right back to emo night. And yeah. what's so cool about it is that it's since it's at Vulcan, it's like all these. I, all these cool guys that I know, you know what I mean. Right. So it's like it's almost like I'm in a place where like it's it, there's a home vibe to it. You know what right. I mean? Like I don't yeah. feel like I'm in somebody else's like like a weird venue. That's no, just so, trying to make money off. So of I this. actually feel more comfortable to let loose. Yeah, you know what I mean. And maybe sing a little, maybe a maybe, tear, maybe yeah. shed a tear. I dude. did. I I have a new joke about it because it's like yeah, I go to I I went to emo night. Um, and the sad part is I went alone. <laughs> 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 you did kind of show up alone. I did. <laughs> That's true. My girl don't want to go to that. No. Yeah. So like I, it, it, but I go there and guys like you were there and there's yeah. like other you know funny dudes that get it that yeah. we can all just like. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that like emo emo uh, music emo comedy night that you did. You did yeah. that at the store. No, I did that at this place called the Virgil. No, okay. no, no, no. Is it the Virgil? Yeah. Yeah. It's on. Virgil, because right. I'm I'm really tight with this guy that owns this uh, metal venue in town. Come and take it. Have you been to a show there mm-hmm. yet? We should go to one. I'll take you to a metal show there or something. Sure. But one of the best rock venues in in the state or in the it, probably in the state. It's my favorite venue in the country that I've played Whoa. in. It's fucking awesome. The walls are lined with like logs and shit. The sound is like Ooh. so crispy and good. Nice. But um, he wants to try to do comedy shows there because I did a little like festival thing with ten local bands, and then I stack I stacked them. I did five, and then three comics in the middle, mm. and then and then five more bands. And you got and a I, taste of the comedy. They loved it, dude. Did it the work me- out there? It worked. Wow. It worked. You can. Add, it, I had Darian, uh, Michael Ridley, and Casey Rocket. 
Nice. And it was, I think, the perfect lineup for that kind of show. Mm-hmm. You know, Casey's wild and shit, and it was mm-hmm. he's kind of a rock show himself, you know? Yeah. And so they loved it, and I was like, oh, shit, like, I'll, I'm going to do this, like, every year. But he wants to do, like, a like maybe a monthly comedy show there and i felt like maybe i could like get better stage time if i did a little spot on you know that show or like whatever and i can work with and i i'm finding all these dudes here that are like into the same metal that i'm into yeah right so it's a lot similar to kind of the the emo thing right and it's like if i can bring i know i can draw when my band plays there we draw people so if i'm like hey guys i'm doing you know we're doing a comedy show every month come out i can get these new faces in the door kind of that are like not maybe going to comedy shows and i haven't seen every Buddy, and mm-hmm. then you can trickle in some you know put mostly the metal comics and then trickle other people in you know because oh, yeah. people that can write like like i was thinking about like if somebody wrote a joke about like how dudes say good set bro without even watching your set uh-huh. you know what i mean because you never go back you he never did, i just got canceled <laughs> yeah yeah exactly but you you never go you never tell them to their face like i didn't just play you go thanks dude yeah, thanks yeah. a lot and then you go back to your boys and you go he just fucking said good set bro to us dude and we didn't even play yet but it's like that that's like a a niche kind of a joke that would never work in like a normal yeah, room right but, but in, a, in a metal show but this is why i'm talking about like don't worry about who's gonna get or what's gonna it. work because it, just try but it. Th- because the joke isn't about the metal or anything it's about like the fake bullshit you know what i mean the right. fakeness yes we could all relate to that true like good set i just fucking yeah i just ate shit or i haven't yeah. even played yet yeah you know? or that's what's funny it's yeah like, that is yeah thanks and that shit I happens he was talking all about. the time I'm yeah like, or i'm not even playing tonight you yeah know what I mean? right like, right just going around uh, shooting good I, set bros yeah. at people just for i i work here <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> uh but yeah it's like the, the I'm finding all these dudes here that like l- they wear metal shirts on stage. I'm like, wait a minute, they, they, there is metal comedians, dude. Oh They're yeah, out there. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. But oh yeah, the other thing that was funny about emo night that I was trying to think about is like you can't, you could never go back. Imagine going back in time and trying to explain this to like the emo kids. Like one day, like hot tattooed black dudes are gonna DJ this music. Yeah, you know, for like. And there's going to be people in there trying to get pussy. Right. And you're just like, what? Uh, <laughs> wait, this is going to be cool one day? Yeah, yeah. No, we're, no, we're, we're, no, uh, no, we're no, counterculture. No. Yeah, nobody's getting pussy here. Hell no. <laughs> yeah. Wait, you guys are getting That pussy? defeats the, that would ruin the whole genre yeah. if we're all getting laid. Yeah, exactly. There's nothing to sing about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. That's awesome, dude. Um, shit. Uh, Let's see what else I have here to talk about with you, bro. I appreciate you coming on here. And of fucking, course, man. This has been a total master class, by the way. So I, It's fucking awesome, dude. How long have we been going, Tony? Uh, hour 46. Oh, yeah. what? Oh, shit. We got to get out of here, dude. That was That's perfect, man. Is Let's this just, your studio? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. So if you, ever, if you know anybody that needs to record a podcast, hit me up. Yeah. yeah. What do you charge? I mean, we can talk about it in a minute. But uh, I want it on the air. I want it on the air, dude. Want to know. No, it d- depends on who you are, dude. <laughs> it depends on what you want. No, but yeah, Matt, I appreciate you coming out, bro. Uh, we can wrap it up there. Uh, plug your shit. Let them know where to find the the uh, the the emo the emo jokes. Yeah, man. Well, you know, I, I'm out here in Austin doing all the spots. Uh, shit, I know I have stuff I should be plugging. Um, let's see. Cap City's happening this month. I wish I would have. You can look it up real quick. Is that cool? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we can edit up, this, dude. right? Um, we, I, no, I want to edit it. It's, it's um, right. We free flow on this pod, dude. Yeah. Let's see. I mean, I'm all, yeah, this. I'm supposed, to be in, I'm supposed to be in Tampa right now, folks. If you're there for the <laughs> Sunshine Comedy Fest, I did drop out. And, uh, <laughs> you heard it here. You heard it here. Let's see. Yeah, I mean. Oh, oh, this is what I got to plug. Fuck, what's the date today? Shit, I got to get on this shit. Um, I'm at... Da, 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 da. Hold on, what's the dude's name? Um, all right. God, I'm so bad at this. This is why I'm, like, nowhere. Um, <laughs> You'll get it down, bro. Uh, what is the place called? It's in Fort Worth, and the, sh- the place is Hyena? called... It's Hyenas. It's the little room. It's the little... Oh, wait, hold on, not that. Let me see. Did this guy ever text me? <laughs> Fuck. Uh, hold on, dude. I'm this sorry. is how they know the pod is real, dude. It's not rehearsed. You know? Yeah, I got I got. It's organic. I got two shows. In, oh, here we go. Here we fucking go, guys. Yes. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> sorry. It's all good, dude. Um, this is it. Are you ready? Okay, guys, I will be at the Red Room in Fort Worth, Texas, Saturday, February 3rd. Uh, 
show uh, doors are at nine shows at 10 and here's the thing i think i have two of them i think i'm doing two that night so just say february 3rd in uh fort worth i'll be there look up uh look me up matt edgar on instagram matt has one t in it i'll be there with the extremely funny and beautiful rachel wolfson that's who i get to see naked all the time and she'll be there she's super nice. funny and uh and you know her from jackass obviously and yeah dude i'm fucking um that's like the big one that i need to promote hyena's cool. red room yeah we'll get this i'll make sure and get this out before then yeah thank you man absolutely that would help. man i just i appreciate you coming on and just being so cool and opening up talking about kind of what needs to be done? I got a lot of work to dude, do. I man. can talk I got about of... all this shit. This is all I think about. It's so. awesome, dude. It's it's cool to see somebody who's just really about it like that. So thanks for the masterclass, brother. And uh, hopefully, if anybody and I know there's a, a handful of open micers and shit that watch this. Hell yeah, I have a bunch of those guys. Come on say here, what but... up to me, man. I'm very uh, cool. Hell yeah, yeah. You don't you, cool, you don't cool guy people. That's no, that's awesome, dude. That's Hell awesome. No. I'm not, I'm not so, that. So I don't have chill. that. I don't have that kind of following yet. So right. Get, so sit, be, say what up to me while you still can. Yeah, get it in, dude. Because yeah, I will he, say fuck it to all of you. Once he know. hits double digits on Instagram, here, it's dude. over, yeah, you dude. You can't talk to you me. Can't t you can't even look at it. I'll dude. never leave the green room. <laughs> all right, brother. All right, bro. Run that outro. You are listening to Gorgas, you idiot.